Okay, cool. So I guess we can uh, we should probably get, get started then. It's just uh, it's one p.m. C um, UTC now. So, um, all right. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, Noises Signal um, Finding Hemo Symposium. Um, my name is Ahmed Khalil. I'm um, one of the organizers um, of the symposium. Um, just a little a bit of a kind of background about the, the symposium. Um, the idea um, for the symposium came about uh, last fall um, during a series of regular meetings that the organizers, so all the people you see on this, um, this screen here on the slide um, that we all have where we um, discussed issues kind of related to, to cerebral hemodynamics and we decided that the, the topic doesn't really receive as much um, attention as it should. And it's sometimes completely missing or kind of inadequately featured at, at scientific meetings and, and conferences. Um, so we started working on kind of developing a, a meeting to address this. And um, it was especially important to us from the start to have it in kind of an educational format that would help kind of empower and encourage brain imaging researchers to, to think about these things um, more carefully. Um, and so what started off being planned as kind of a handful of lectures grew to a three-day program um, with 20 different, uh, different, different speakers. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity, opportunity to thank all the speakers for their really wonderful contributions and also for being very kind and patient uh, over the past few weeks with all the emails I've been sending around. Um, so as you can see, the first day, start, which is today basically, starts off with um, talks covering the fundamentals of, of brain anatomy um, and physiology, especially related to the vasculature as well as um, we'll be talking as well uh, about pulse sequences, um, functional imaging and the signal sources that you see in, or you get in, in functional imaging and also signal processing. And then on the second day tomorrow, we um, cover kind of applications of functional imaging that are related to hemodynamics, um, both in terms of how hemodynamic signals interfere with the interpretation of neuroimaging studies, but also in terms of um, how they can provide, or the hemodynamics can kind of provide useful information, especially in the context of, of disease. Um, and the second day tomorrow, it also includes um, two keynote lectures that I'm personally very excited about, um, given by, by Jean Chen and Arno Fillinger. And then on the last day, the day after tomorrow, um, there'll be a workshop um, where you can learn more about some of the tools that are useful for extracting um, hemodynamic information from, from imaging data. Uh, and the workshop will also include a demonstration of these tools and a hands-on session where you can kind of apply this to, to your own um, data or to real data. Um, so before we kind of officially start the, the symposium and the first talk, um, just a few bits of information. Um, first of all, the entire symposium is being recorded and will be made um, publicly available uh, later. Um, we have a code of conduct. Uh, please do take a look at it and kind of note that your participation in the symposium implies that you, you agree to abide by this code. And this code it includes things like being respectful of others and maintaining scientific integrity and, and professionalism. Um, and there will be a few minutes allocated to questions after the end, uh, at the end of each talk and then a longer discussion period at the end of each session. So if you'd like to ask a question to the speakers, um, please do so by writing the question in the Q&A window. Um, so preferably not in the chat if you have a question directly to the speakers, but in the Q&A window. Um, we do expect and hope for a lot of questions. So if your question doesn't get answered during the meeting, just know that the, um, these questions will be forwarded to the speakers uh, on Slack or, or via email. And um, during the discussion periods at the end of each session, you can also just raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can, so you can ask a question. Um, if you're active on social media, please post about the, the symposium and the talks and uh, use the hashtag finding hemo. Um, and finally, if you haven't already, please join the Slack channel. There'll be more discussions with the speakers and other participants taking place there. We'll also be updated, uh, posting updates on the meeting um, there as well. Um, and you can find links to the Slack channel, to the program, to the code of conduct, um, all on the, uh, the symposium website, which is noisesignal.org. And yeah. Um, and then we can basically, I guess, get started with the first talk, unless 
any one of the organizers has anything to uh, to add to? Okay, great. So, Ioannis, I will stop sharing my screen and then maybe you can fire up the first um, presentation, the first talk. Sure. Thanks. Um, so the uh, first talk will be by uh, Dr. Kevin uh, Whittingstall. Um, and uh, Dr. Whittingstall is a full professor at the Department of uh, Radiology and an adjunct professor in the Department of Computer Science uh, at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada. Um, he received his master's and his PhD in physics at, at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and completed uh, postdoc studies at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen, Germany. Um, his main research interests are um, the development of non-invasive tools for measuring and interpreting uh, brain function and structure in humans. Um, in particular, his lab focuses on the balance between neural activity and cerebral blood supply, so neurovascular coupling, and how disruptions in this balance are, are related to, to brain diseases. Um, since 2011, he, held, he holds a Canada Research Chair in Neurovascular Coupling. Great. So I just want to make sure that you guys can see my screen. Is that correct? Yeah, I can and see your screen. I'll play it now. And if we have any issues with the sound, just let me know. Okay. Great. Sounds good. All right. So uh, thank you very much for attending today. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for putting together this really wonderful uh, symposium uh, devoted to a topic that is uh, near and dear to, to my heart as well as, as others. And uh, so today I'll give you a very brief recap of the kind of research that we're interested in and how it may apply to those of you who are interested in understanding the, um, the physiological basis of hemodynamic signals in the brain. And as we'll see, the anatomy of the brain, the anatomy of the vessels are going to play a big role in how we try and understand the link between uh, the neurons and the blood vessels. So let's get right to it. Um, we all know that the brain is an extremely greedy organ consumes an enormous amount of oxygen that's needed to power cortical computation. And we can have these large blood vessels here on the surface of the brain and the smaller vessels that penetrate the cortex and come into direct contact with the neurons. So when we talk about the relationship between neural activity and blood flow, we're often thinking about the neurovascular unit that we see down here where uh, glia cells and neurons, uh, or at least some neurons, are in direct contact with the smaller penetrating capillaries and arterioles, whereas the large surface vessels are completely devoid of contact with, with neural and glial cells but are more innervated by these large uh, cranial nerves that run along the wall of the, uh, of the vessel. And um, blood flow is not only important, of course, for fundamental research, but we know that decreases in blood flow have very important repercussions for brain health. In fact, there are uh, several papers come, that have come out in the last decade or so, maybe even longer, who point to blood flow abnormalities as being the key event that uh, begins uh, the downward spiral. And so when we think about, for example, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, there are some, um, uh, some reports out there indicating that the first event or the, the first visible event where something might be going wrong is in the vasculature. And so understanding what controls blood flow is going to play a crucial role, role in understanding uh, neurodegenerative uh, disorders. So when we think about blood flow to the brain in general, we think of two mechanisms uh, that play a large role in controlling it. The first one uh, 
is autoregulation. So we see here that blood flow on the y-axis and systemic blood pressure here on the x-axis. Um, we know that within a certain range of blood pressure, the cerebral blood flow will actually stay the same, um, and this is due to active changes in the diameter, more specifically the luminal diameter of the blood vessels. Uh, if we go beyond this regime, well then we have a breakdown of autoregulation, which can lead to stroke. And early on, uh, there were some really nice studies showing that the large arteries in the brain, here we have the basilar uh, artery, which feeds the, the posterior and occipital lobe, were innervated by large cranial nerves. For example, here we have the trigeminal nerve, and you can see all of its, um, of its collaterals kind of, kind of innervating this large artery. And this perivascular innervation is quite important because we know that these nerves don't go into the neurovascular unit, but as they control the tone of the large blood vessels, we can directly see that any changes in um, uh, sympathetic activity from these nerves, if it affects the size of the large surface vessels, then it could change blood flow dynamics down in the neurovascular unit even if neural activity was left unchanged. The second important component, the one that most of us are interested in, is so-called neurovascular coupling. So here, what we'll find is that the diameter of the small blood vessels in the brain will change despite no change in blood pressure. And so here, these, these changes in diameter are uh, driven essentially by the metabolic need of, of neurons. And so as the neurons are activated, they will signal to the nearby vasculature to induce a small vasodilation, which then decreases the pressure and promotes blood flow into the neurovascular unit. And so for the most part, when we think about changes in blood flow in the brain, we often associate it to a change in neural activity. In fact, the fundamental basis of functional imaging is that when we see changes in whether it's blood flow or bold, that it is closely tied to the activity of nearby neurons. Now the issue with this is that um, every year or so, there are a series of studies that are published which demonstrate, which which I refer to as neurovascular uncoupling. So these are studies which uh, either report very weak correlations or in some cases just no correlation whatsoever between the electrical activity of neurons and nearby hemodynamics. And so while a lot of attention has been paid to the coupling, to the implicit assumption that neural activity and blood flow go together, we actually raised the question, well, can we safely assume that changes in blood flow that we measure, often on MRI, can we safely assume that this is always due to neuronal activity? And so one way to think about this is to look at what happens in autism. Uh, these are some nice studies which showed that if you were to, for example, present a visual stimulus while measuring uh, the bold response, you'll notice that in autistic and in um, children without autism, the bold response is very, very, very similar between the two. No major differences in signal amplitude or latency. But if you repeat the experiment, but this time measure EEG, so measure the neural, the mass neural activity on the surface of the scalp, you find that in autism, there's about a 50% reduction in neural activity. This is often expressed by looking in the higher gamma band frequencies. So which one of these is correct? Well, perhaps the more important question is, how can we see a similar response in hemodynamics between these two groups, but yet see a relatively massive difference in the electrical activity? So in order to adjust, the first thing to ensure is that our methodology is correct. So we showed a long time ago that despite being almost 100 years old, 
The electroencephalogram is actually a very accurate marker of underlying neuronal activity. So we did some of the first simultaneous measurements of surface EEG on the surface of, of the scalp with some intracortical electrodes in alert and behaving macaque monkeys and found that if you compare the surface EEG signal to the uh, what's known as the local uh, field potential or even the spiking activity of, of, um, of individual neurons, you see a fairly good correlation between the two. Now this is good because EEG is completely non-invasive, but perhaps more importantly, uh, there's technology now where you can record EEG and uh, um, bold or blood flow in the scanner um, at the same time. So we can put people in the scanner and get simultaneous measurements of, uh, of both markers. And so here's an example of the uh, uh, time frequency uh, representation of EEG activity both inside the scanner and outside the scanner. Uh, you can see that uh, when, you, when you remove all these um, electromagnetic artifacts associated with acquiring small voltages in a very noisy environment, uh, you get a fairly decent correlation between the two. So now that we know that our measures are, are, uh, are working, um, we can now start to look at the coupling between uh, the two signals. So here's a very simple experiment that we did. We showed a series of visual stimuli to subjects while recording uh, both measurements at the same time. You can see here that when you show a visual stimulus, you have an increase in high frequency neuronal activity, otherwise known as the gamma band, and a change or a, a decrease in, in the low frequencies, otherwise known as the alpha band. Now, when you correlate these signals to bold, what we found is that you have a very nice correlation between the gamma band activity in bold in the early visual cortex, otherwise known as area V1. But when you look for the best correlation of the alpha band, it's located more in the extra striate areas or the lateral occipital areas. And so we found that in fact, depending on the neural signal that you're interested in, you're likely to find correlations in different brain areas. And in other words, the neurovascular relationship or the coupling uh, most likely varies depending on where you are in the brain. And this makes sense because we know that the neural circuitry making up the brain has regional variations. As I'll show later, uh, there are very, very important vascular variations as well. So right off the bat, it's going to be complicated to compare neurovascular coupling uh, because the results might change depending on where you are in the brain. But even if we stay in the same brain area, uh, we can easily turn coupling on and off. So here's an example where we showed very basic visual stimuli. We just increased the contrast of the stimuli and we'll note that there was an increase in the gamma band response, which was limited over the occipital lobe. And we noticed the bold signal also increased with increasing stimulus contrast. So up until this point here, you see that there's very nice and tight neurovascular coupling. But then all we did is we slightly changed the spatial integrity of the stimuli. We did what's called spatial randomization, where we simply swap the position of the pixels and it, and it kind of decorrelates the, uh, the stimuli. And when you decorrelate the, the stimuli or you decrease the synchrony that's going into the brain, you have a very strong decrease in the EEG signal, but you'll notice that the bowl signal stays the same. So with a very slight change in stimulus um, appearance, you can basically induce neurovascular uncoupling in a healthy brain in the same brain area. And that's because, of course, the neural signals that you measure in the brain are highly dependent uh, of the synchrony of, 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 the, of the sensory inputs while blood flow uh, is mostly determined by the amount of input that it receives, regardless if those inputs are synchronized or not. So um, if we go back to our example where we saw that in autism there's a marked decrease in EEG but no change in CBF, this could be simply due to the fact that while the amount of input being delivered to the brain is the same, the synchrony of those inputs is, uh, is quite different.
Another example of why bold and neural signals uh, could go in opposite directions is uh, the effect of neuromodulation. Uh, so in this experiment, what we did is we presented a black fixation point to subjects uh, while they were in the scanner. As soon as the fixation point turned red, the subjects knew that two seconds later, there'll be one of three stimuli that are presented, either a high contrast stimuli, a low contrast stimuli, or no stimuli whatsoever. And so again, with the high contrast, you see a nice gamma response. It's reduced in the low contrast, but in the no stimulus condition, there was no change in neural activity. But when we looked at the simultaneous bold measurements, we noted that in the no stimulus condition in the primary visual cortex, we nevertheless saw a robust increase in bold, despite the fact that there was no visual input. And when we looked at the, uh, the pupil, more, more, more specifically, the, 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 um, the size of the, of the pupil in those three conditions, we noticed that typically when there's visual input, the retina or the, the, the pupil, uh, excuse me, will, um, will contract. But in the no stimulus condition, what we're finding is a very, very small dilation. Uh, which could be indicative of this neuromodulatory anticipatory input uh, driving into the brain, which doesn't necessarily drive a neural response, but does give a vascular response. And finally, the effect of structure on the brain, uh, vascular structure may also generate some neurovascular uncoupling. So here, for example, is an MR angiography image of the posterior cerebral artery in white. So these are the large arteries that feed the occipital lobe. This is the artery at rest, and this is the same artery this time during visual stimulation. And you'll notice in the yellow arrows here, there is a significant vasodilation uh, associated with the visual stimulus, which of course makes sense because when there's vasodilation, there's an increase in flow. But when we reconstruct the artery, and plot the vasodilation as a function of a distance from the occipital lobe, we found that near the end or near the, 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 the most posterior portion, of, uh, portion of, um, of the visual cortex, we had about 30% vasodilation in the small vessels. But that vasodilation, although it decreased as we move more and more um, um, anteriorly towards the front of the brain, the vasodilation was still prominent up until 70 millimeters away from the visual cortex. So in other words, if I was to reconstruct the PCA uh, with its normal um, anatomical labels, where P4 represents the end of the PCA, P1, P2, the more proximal segments of, uh, of the PCA, we found that there was actually significant dilation all the way up until P1. So this means that even though the neural activity is likely to be local around here, we nevertheless see dilation all the way up until P1. Uh, this may be due to a retrograde vasodilation that travels anteriorly. Um, but nevertheless, this means that in P1, P2, these proximal sections, uh, we're going to see uh, perhaps an increase of blood flow that might seep into these branching uh, arteries that perfuse something like the thalamus. So in this example here, we might see an increase in CBF in the thalamus simply because there was excess perfusion or excess dilation in the more proximal se uh, segments of the circle of Willis. So again, this might be an example of where we would see an increase in blood flow, although no changes in local neuronal activity. And so when we put this all together, we realize that there's probably a third uh, section that is associated with uh, neurovascular coupling that um, we often don't really think about, which is the structure of the blood vessel. So we know that you know, precise control of blood, of, of blood flow to the brain is, is, is critical, but what's also really important is the shape of the blood vessel. If the vessel is damaged, it doesn't really matter how well you signal it to act in a certain way, it's probably going to lead to, um, uh, to, uh, to small changes in, in, in blood flow.
So what we've done in the past couple of years is developed hardware and software in an attempt to uh, automatically reconstruct all the vessels uh, that are visible on MRI, whether it's venous or arterial vessels. Our first attempt at doing this uh, was published um, a, few, a few years ago. Um, you can access the code for reconstructing these vessels uh, online uh, free of charge. But we've recently uh, tried to improve on the procedure. Uh, one of the reasons uh, for doing so is that when we segment vessels on MRI, we often generate some, some false positives. So in an attempt to reduce these false positives, we decided to first reconstruct the circle of Willis. And so what we did is used uh, some deep learning mechanisms to, um, to try and localize not only, or not only segment the circle of Willis, uh, but also to label its subcomponents. And so the way the software works, we call it the intracranial vessel analysis toolbox. We take a raw angiography image, it could be through MRI or through CTA, the software will automatically localize the segments of the circle of Willis and then quantify the diameter on a voxel by voxel basis. Now the advantage of this is that uh, it's uh, very similar to human annotation. So the results we get with the software are very similar to what a expert human would manually annotate. Uh, to label and segment the circle of Willis currently takes about under 10 seconds on a standard computer. Uh, we've also shown that it works over a wide variety of uh, angiography images. The quality is independent of field strength or SNR. And it actually has a very nice uh, reliability as well. So if we uh, apply the software um, on uh, multiple acquisitions of, of the same subjects, we get uh, the same results time and time again. But the main reason we did this was not so much to focus on the circle of Willis, but to remove these false positives that we get in, um, in the parenchyma. And so now that we have a nice um, uh, representation of, of the circle of Willis, we can then simply propagate these labels outwards into the, in, in, uh, into the remaining vasculature. And now um, we have very few false positives. And the most important part is that every vessel now maintains its label. So we can store all these values very easily in a spreadsheet and, um, and talk about things like diameter, uh, branching, tortuosity on a vessel by vessel basis. So one thing we can do is uh, very quickly look at uh, rapid changes in vessel diameter. Uh, and look for luminal narrowing, otherwise known as stenosis. So here, for example, in the yellow arrows, you see prominent narrowing along the anterior cerebral artery. And when viewed with our software, you can see the diameter transitions that happen quite, um, quite sharply in these two areas here. And so because we have a diameter value along the, the entire segment of the artery, we can very quickly pinpoint the distance at which the narrowing is quite prominent. And all these uh, results can very, very quickly be ported to a simple PDF file, which will tell the clinician uh, where this vessel stenosis is, is located. Now, vessel stenosis, we think, is quite important, and it's something that we often forget when we're trying to interpret blood flow in different pathological disorders. Uh, so here, for example, is a study that we're doing where we uh, look at how the different intracranial vessels appear in mild cognitive impairment. And so if we look at the posterior cerebral artery, you'll notice that when it's close to the circle of Willis, so the large portion of the PCA, we're not seeing a huge difference between control and mind cognitive impairment. But once we're 10, 15 millimeters away from the circle of Willis, once we're in the distal portion of this large artery, that's where we start seeing a significant reduction in diameter in people with mild cognitive impairment. And um, we're now trying to compare this to, to, to post-mortem analysis when looking at whether or not this is effect of, uh, of, uh, of a buildup of, of atherosclerosis within the artery, which causes the artery to appear thinner, uh, or whether this is an active vasoconstriction phenomenon. Uh, we're still not sure yet, but with the software, we can now try to address these, uh, these questions.
One thing that also interests us a lot is that we know that uh, women are roughly two to three times more likely to develop dementia and Alzheimer's later in life. And um, we often think that there, there may be a role of, of, of hormones in all this. Uh, so what we're doing now is uh, imaging women, um, you know, pregnant women, um, and looking at how or whether or not there's, there's, there's remodeling of these intracranial vessels throughout gestation. And what we're finding, again, is uh, that the posterior circulation, the PCA, tends to be in a vasoconstricted state um, in late pregnancy compared to normal uh, non-pregnant women. Uh, while the women are in the scanner, we've also developed the technology to acquire uh, fetal brain images, not only to see the tissue, the gray matter and the white matter, but we're also slowly making headway in reconstructing the fetal circle of Willis along with the maternal brain and looking at correlations between the two. And this may lead to a more generalized question, which is, um, are there sex differences in the cerebrovascular network? And indeed, what we're finding is that um, if you compare the amount of gray and white matter, of course, normalized to intracranial volume, we don't see a whole lot of difference in the cortical gray matter or white matter between males and females. However, when you look at the number of vessels per tissue, so the so-called vascular density, we see that females have significantly lower vascular density than, than males. And so this raises the possibility that might the female brain be at an increased vulnerability to vascular uh, insult uh, later in life. And so, uh, and so these are some of the questions that we can now answer when, when looking at these, um, at these blood. Okay, so um, to wrap it all up, I think that uh, there are two important things to take from, uh, from this, the first being that I think by now it's pretty clear that changes in cerebral hemodynamics um, are not always going to match up with measures of neuronal activity, even if you're in a healthy brain in the same brain area. Uh, a lot of this may be due to the fact that um, large blood vessels are under different types of neural control than the smaller vessels in the neurovascular unit. Uh, so this is going to play a big role in when we look at uh, whether or not changes in neural activity translate to changes in CBF. The second thing that's quite important is that uh, the, the, the inherent structure of the blood vessel is also going to play a role in how much blood is delivered to the neuron. So if you have two conditions where uh, the neural activity is essentially the same, but in one scenario the blood vessel is compromised, well, you will see a change in cerebral dynamics that isn't necessarily translated in the changes in neural activity. And so I'd just like to quickly thank all the wonderful um, lab members uh, and my collaborators, and as well as all of the funding agencies that are so generous in supporting our research. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask now. If you have questions about the software as well, uh, it's not online um, yet, uh, but if you send me an email, I'd be more than happy to send you a beta version of the vessel recognition software. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Whittingstall, for that great uh, for that great talk. Um, just a reminder to the uh, to the participants, um, you can just kind of write your questions in the uh, Q and A um, at at any at any moment during the um, either during or after the talk, and we'll collect them and then um, and then ask the speakers. So we've got a couple of questions already. Um, we have maybe about. Um, just under 10 minutes before the before the next uh, talk is due to start. So, um, so the first question is, um, is it feasible to correlate EEG and va vascular coupling using near infrared spectroscopy? Um, would the gamma band correlate with increased local oxyhemoglobin increases? Um, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So uh, absolutely. 
Um, they actually have um, EEG caps in which the optodes can be integrated next to the, the electrodes and you can get very nice uh, simultaneous measurements. Um, I feel as though there is some work out there showing a nice uh, link between gamma and, uh, and oxyhemoglobin. Uh, and so, um, in fact, I think that uh, uh, combining uh, FNIRS and EEG is going to pay, play a big role in uh, establishing this link uh, in the future. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, another question is um, so. The, your measurements of vasodilation distal from the foci of neural activity changes are important for interpreting stimulus evoked bold data. However, the bold signal arises mainly from static dephasing in the venous domain, not the arterial one. Can you say if you have any data on venous dilation? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we did not show the data, but in that particular study, we also acquired uh, SWI images, which um, we, we think anyways is, is highlighting the venous vasculature. And uh, in fact, we did not see any prominent venous dilation during visual stimulus, which puzzled us as first because we would, we would have expected an increase in blood volume. But in and around the area of arterial vasodilation, uh, there was not any significant venous uh, vasodilation. Okay. Um, and um, so another person asks, um, are there any approximations via existing software um, for vessels from non-MRA images, such as from T1 alone? Um, this, is, this would be useful if you have um, um, if you don't have an MRA, basically, um, or if your protocol doesn't include an angiography, an MR angiogram. Um, so so do, do, do you know of any kind of, of software or anything that works on kind of non-angiography data to try to do vessel segmentation? Or I think this is the most common question I've been getting in the past couple of years. And unfortunately, the answer is no. It's very, very difficult to do accurate vessel segmentation on T1. Um, it's not impossible. I mean, I'm sure with machine learning the way it is these days, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but uh, I would strongly, in fact, a, a message I've been pushing for some years now is that when you collect your ball data, uh, that, you, that you really think twice about um, acquiring either an SWI or um, if it were me, I would acquire an MRA. It's, it's five minutes and it can provide a ton of information, um, not only for, uh, for increasing the, um, I would say the accuracy of your bold hotspot or to, to interpret the accuracy of your bold hotspot, uh, but it also opens for uh, more studies that you, can, that, that you can do. So you can get two papers for the price of one. So, you know, why not, uh, why not do it? Great, yeah. And um, I was just a related question um, just about the, um, about the uh, vessel segmentation software. So have you looked uh, into how the, the, the software kind of deals with vessel anomalies? So duplicated vessels, kind of atypical origins, um, you see this quite commonly, so these, these variations in the, in the vasculature. So, um, so how does that work or how well does that work? Um, so, so far, we're very good at recognizing all the possible variants in the circle of Willis. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the communicating arteries, uh, in particular, the PCOM, these things are often quite faint on MRA. So sometimes we miss them, but sometimes we catch them. I don't know if that's an anomaly or just a small PCOM. Um, I showed you some data on stenosis. We're quite confident with the stenosis up until 70%. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, the blood flow is so, is so low that there's just not a lot of signal that we, that we get. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, what was the other anomaly you mentioned? 
Um, no, I was just giving examples like uh, duplicated vessels, for example, you see this sometimes like someone has two PCAs or two ACAs or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, as long as it fills in to our bank of 28 variants of the circle of Willis, mm -hmm. uh, when we, I mentioned that we propagate the vasculature outwards, once we have a good circle of Willis, well, then we simply flood fill the remaining vasculature. So it doesn't matter how crazy that blood vessel is. Uh, there's a good chance we're going to capture it. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, so there's another question. Um, is it possible to gain a proxy measure of the arteriolar vasodilation or the arterial vasodilation oscillatory frequency from the EEG itself? So from the EEG signals. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question, sorry? So um, is it possible to gain a proxy measure of the arterial vasodilation oscillatory frequency from the EEG itself? Yes, so the... yes. Yeah, uh, excellent question. So uh, it currently takes us, uh, the fastest we can do is about two minutes to get a full brain um, vessel map. So in two minutes, we cannot capture any kind of, of oscillations. We tried this year to do ultra fast acquisitions of a tiny, vessel segment um, and our goal was to actually see these uh, these dynamic changes in vessel diameter um, but we're really struggling with with inflow effects uh, so when the fresh blood comes in we've got this other signal to deal with uh, so unfortunately as of right now uh, we, we we cannot get oscillations um, non-invasively from, from from at least our uh, acquisitions all right, um, and perhaps just uh, the last question: uh, Could desynchronous electrical activity explain a, uh, explain the lack of increased thalamic electrical activity despite increased P one slash P two flow? Excellent point. Uh, I didn't think of that, but it's it's most certainly a possibility. Very good point. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Wittenstall. I think we'll uh, just to, to also to remind the, the other, uh, there are some questions that we haven't, we didn't manage to answer yet, but there will be a longer discussion session uh, at the end of this session. And we will also email any kind of outstanding um, questions to the speakers after uh, the symposium. So yeah, but thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, um, so then we, we should move on to the to the next uh, talk about um, cerebrovascular physiology. Um, this talk will be given by Dr. Joseph Fisher. Um, Dr. Joseph Fisher graduated, graduated with an MD and completed his specialty training in internal medicine and anesthesiology at the University of Toronto. And he's currently an anesthesiologist at the Toronto General Hospital and professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, his research interests in cardiorespiratory physiology led to the development of the Respira Act and two decades of MRI and cerebrovascular research. Um, the, Dr. Fisher is the founder of Thornhill Medical, uh, which is a for-profit spin-off company from Toronto General Hospital that has also developed the Respira Act as a, a non-commercial um, research tool. And uh, he'll be talking to us about um, cerebral, uh, cerebrovascular physiology, so. Hi, my name is Joe Fisher. I'm from the University Health Network at the University of Toronto. I'm going to be speaking today about probing fundamental cerebrovascular physiology. I'm not going to be talking very much about cerebrovascular physiology other than what can be discovered using magnetic resonance imaging. The basic blood supply to the brain comes in through the carotid vertebral arteries. There is some centrifugal flow vessels going into the parenchyma, and uh, there are large vessels that go to the outside of the brain, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. They form a network covering the outside of the brain, and they send vessels penetrating into the cortex, into the white matter. They anastomose with each other throughout the brain, and there are also some deep penetrating vessels that end up being the sole perfusion to an area that is actually a watershed area in the brain. Other than that, the vessels are largely anastomosed with the anterior 
middle and posterior cerebral arteries intertwine as shown here and don't actually perfuse isolated identifiable parts of the brain. They intermingle their blood. The penetrating arterioles also have anastomosis enabling collateral blood flow and the capillaries also form a dense network where blood flow can be distributed to various parts of the brain. We began our studies about 20 years ago looking at large vessel stenoclusive disease. Our hypothesis was that if we did cerebrovascular reactivity, if we gave a high CO2 stimulus and looked at the changes in blood flow on the sides of the brain, the sides that had a severe stenosis would have a steel phenomenon, the blood flow would go down. And we also hypothesized that severity of the stenosis would be related to the uh, degree of steel that we would observe. Here's an example. Uh, on the top panel, we have a stenosis on the right carotid artery. The left carotid artery is fairly normal. In this example, we gave an increase in PCO2, which was a vasoactive stimulus. This caused a global vasodilation. The blood flow increased, the bold signal uh, as a surrogate of the blood flow increased on the side of the lesion on the right side. The warm colors in this color scale show an increase in blood flow and the cool colors show a decrease in blood flow. And on the side of the lesion, there was steel, there was a reduction in blood flow. And again, we hypothesized that this reduction in blood flow would be proportional to the severity of the steel. This was all well and good, except for the fact that we saw a number of cases, such as shown here in the lower panel. Here in this side, the, the, in this slide, the stenosis is now on the left. And we gave the same CO2 stimulus, the identical CO2 stimulus. There was an increase in blood flow on the healthy side. And there was also an increase in blood flow on the side of the lesion. This required some explanation and required us to go back and re-explain and re-examine the mechanism of steel. The first element that was important is to understand that there was an inflow resistance. When you had distal vasodilation, this inflow resistance was not able to supply all the dilation. In other words, anywhere in the brain, the flow capacity by vasodilation exceeded the ability of any artery to provide that. This is true whether this is the carotid artery or some artery branch inside the brain. The flow potential from vasodilation was greater distal to that artery than could be supplied by the artery. So here we had the carotid stenosis and uh, the blood flow was maintained. The patient was ambulatory. And we understood this as uh, a compensatory effect of reduction in resistance distal to the artery due to autoregulation. The important thing here was to understand that by the autoregulation encroached on the vasodilatory reserve that was available. The flow was normal to both sides, but when we increased the PCO2 as a vasodilatory stimulus, the side distal to the stenosis had no vasodilation to provide. And the other sides increased their blood flow by reducing their resistance. This increase in flow reduced the perfusion pressure on the side of the, re reduced the perfusion pressure because the carotid artery was unable to provide the flow. And this reduction in perfusion pressure reduces the flow to the side of the stenosis and resulted in the asymmetry we see here on the CVR. And this was all well and good, except for the fact that from time to time, we saw patients as shown here in the lower panel. Here again, there is a severe stenosis on one side, the other side is normal. We provided a CO2 stimulus and there was no steel on the side of the stenosis. There was a positive response, positive flow.
that required some explanation. And we explained it as follows. Again, there's inflow resistance. No artery can provide the flow that the distal vasculature is capable of by dilating. There is the stenosis. However, there's no encroachment on the vasodilatory reserve as there was in the upper panel because there was a collateral path for the blood flow. So that when the PCO2 was increased, both sides are able to dilate and the collateral blood flow provided an increase in flow on both sides and the CVR was positive bilaterally. This gave us some insight and the understanding that those areas that had steel had no collateral blood flow and those areas that had no steel the reason was because there was collateral blood flow. So rather than being a test of the severity of stenosis, this was a test of the presence of collateral blood flow. Now I'm going to apply the same principle to smaller vessels. At this point, I'd like to introduce the experimental paradigm we use in our laboratory to generate the data, which I'm going to show you in the rest of this talk. So the PCO2 on this axis and the black line starts off at a baseline. We have a step change. We hyperventilate, the patient is asked to hyperventilate, the PCO2 falls. We control the PCO2 to provide a progressive increase in PCO2 and we come back to a baseline. Uh, this is repeated, can be repeated a second time or more times, and uh, this is completely repeatable. The stimulus is totally repeatable because it's mechanical and it's independent of what the patient does, how the patient breathes, etc. An interesting thing is that if one looks at the most responsive voxel in the scan, it follows the PCO2 very well during the ramp and in the response. It, if one repeats the study, a good voxel, could be the same one, could be another one, again, follows the PCO2 very well. In red, we have the changes in the brain as a whole, on average, the changes in bold signal on average. And this patient had bilateral moya moya, and the response is very dampened, as you can see. What I want to illustrate with this slide is that the stimulus is completely reproducible. And if you reproduce the stimulus, the voxels that are responsive, that can respond, will respond exactly to the stimulus in a stereotyped way. And I'm going to also introduce something new here. Rather than just having a boxcar, we've introduced here the ramp. And the ramp will play an important role in the rest of this talk in unraveling much of the brain vascular physiology. Speed of response. Here is the CVR from the patient that I showed you in the graphs. This patient had bilateral moya moya and uh, the cool colors indicating steel, this patient had a large amount of steel bilaterally. The second CVR is approximately the same as the first. The ramp, both CVRs are approximately the same, show the same type of material to the extent that, that the images are the same. But the difference that I want to point out is that the amount of positive CVR is much greater in the ramp. In other words, the amount of steel is much less with the ramp than there is with the step. This requires some explanation. This is data taken from our paper in 2015. In those days, we did a two-step paradigm. And the black again represents the PCO2 and the red represents the bold signal. 
In a good voxel with a rapid response, the PCO2 and the bold signal are very reproducible. When one graphs the end tidal PCO2 versus the bold, one gets a small scatter in the data. A regression gives the CVR, the change in bold signal versus the change in PCO2. If we interrogate another vessel with a poor response, with a dampened response, the changes in PCO2, the changes in bold signal rather, don't exactly follow the changes in PCO2. So during a PCO2 50, there are a number of bold signals over time. If one graphs those, one has a larger scatter and the regression line is much flatter than what one would have. So the CVR in this case, if uh, calculated in the normal way, would be low, but it wouldn't be true because the amplitude of change, how much the vascular, the extent that the vascular can respond is actually normal. The real problem is that there is a delay in response. The vessels <coughs> respond more slowly. To capture that, we calculated, we assumed that, that uh, these were first order exponentials. We calculate a time constant for the delay that would fit this response. And we called that the tau. We corrected for that and we regraphed the data and that would give us a CVR a change in amplitude of, of bold signal for a given change in PCO2 that was back to normal as we saw in, in the healthy voxels. However, it gave us another new metric, which was the speed of response, if we took tau as the speed of response. And this gives us now more information. We see that if we correct for the tau, for the slowness of response, the CVR is normal, there is no steel. This is the color scale for changes in the, in the tau, the green colors being very long tau. And there was a large distribution in this patient of very slow vessels that take a long time before they dilate. Now to explain the CVR that we see, so this is due to the step change and this is due to the ramp. There's much more positive CVR in the ramp because the ramp occurs over a prolonged period of time, providing enough time for the vessels with the long tau to actually dilate. Now I'm going to show some interesting data and metrics about the strength of response. If one looks at the PCO2 versus the amount of dilation, one gets a sigmoidal response in healthy patients. In vessels that have a weaker response, that can't response, can't dilate as much, there is a dampened response. If one performs a ramp stimulus, and one goes back to the model that we started with, instead of having a left and right hemisphere, let's call this two vascular beds, a healthy vascular bed and a vascular bed that has some pathology, either abnormal vasculature or upstream stenosis or something like that. And this can happen on any scale. You have each vascular bed has its main feeding vessel and both feeding vessels come from a single vessel and this reproduces the same paradigm as having two carotid arteries and two uh, hemispheres in the brain. So if we go back to this paradigm and we ask what happens during the ramp? So as the PCO2 goes up from uh, hypocapnic to normal capnic, in this area, the voxel that we're examining has enough vasodilatory reserve and strength to be able to maintain its, its own and compete with the healthy voxel and the blood flow, the bold signal, increases. If one continues to increase the PCO2 in the ramp, 
the healthy vessels have a greater dilatory capacity, so they will get a greater flow. The perfusion pressure will fall, and the flow to the examined voxel will fall. And we see these biphasic concave down responses when we look at vessels, when we look at voxels, when we do the ramp. If one had done a breath hold, then one could have gotten a positive CVR, or one could have gotten a negative CVR, depending on the change, if you gave carbogen, depending on the change in PCO2. If one did resting state, one would get, one would interrogate only a small part of this relationship, and one would get whatever that would show but one would miss out on the extra information that is available by looking at a wider range of PCO2 stimuli. Looking at changes in carbon dioxide sensitivity. Again, coming back to the same paradigm, two vascular beds, two perfusing pressures, two perfusing vessels. What we saw in the, with the ramp, what we saw in the, in some voxels was rather than a rise and increase in flow, we saw a decrease in flow. And if we continue to increase the PCO2, the bold signal increased. Again, a biphasic response, only this time concave up. The explanation that we are forced to give this is that there's a decrease in sensitivity to CO2. So that at initial increases in PCO2, the healthy vessels dilate and they reduce the perfusion pressure and there's a reduction in flow in the examined vessel. If one continues to increase the PCO2, the healthy vessels reach a limit in their vasodilatory capacity the examined vessels are now able to dilate that increase in PCO2, their sensitivity is down, but perhaps their range is uh, fairly normal and their blood flow goes up. If one gave a breath hold or carbogen, one can get a positive CVR, one can get a negative CVR, depending on how high the PCO2 is and how much shifted the curve is. If one did resting state, again, one interrogates only a small part of this relationship. This is a CVR map. And if one looks at the, at the various voxels, some of the voxels have what we call type A. They were the normal healthy voxels. Some of them had weakened voxels as I just showed, with showing a biphasic concave down response. Uh, these had limited vasodilatory reserve. Those that had no vasodilatory reserve, they had no positive flow initially. The flow was negative throughout the range. And then there's those that had the delayed response due to decreased sensitivity to CO2. So the CVR is just the what we see here in the dotted line, it's just a single line. However, more interpretation, a physiological interpretation is available. So if we take these patterns and we color code them, we can make a map. And this map shows us where the healthy normal uh, voxels are, and that's shown here in the red. Where those that have a weakened response are, those are shown in the blue. Those that have no vasodilatory reserve at all, those are shown in the dark blue. And then the yellow, those that have a decreased resistance, that, that, have, that are resistant to increases in PCO2, a decreased sensitivity. So we started off with voxel sigmoidal resistance response to PCO2, and we ended up interrogating these by looking at the blood flow pattern on a ramp. 
Now the question is, if we looked, if we had this pattern, this ramp pattern, could we recalculate and figure out what is happening in the resistance in the voxels that we're interrogating? In other words, we started off here with a weak voxel and we got a concave down response with the ramp. Could we take this concave down ramp and figure out how weak the vasculature is in that voxel? How, how weak the vasodilatory response is? And similarly, in these, could we figure out how much delay there is in the response? And this was done in this paper by Jim Duffin and the rest of the group, uh, published in Human Brain Mapping. Again, taking our paradigm, our model, we made an electrical analog of that model, having two resistances coming from uh, a source and a resistance. We interrogate this resistance. We assume that this has the normal range of resistance from our best pixel. So looking at the bold signal, we put in our best pixel result. We put in our interrogated voxel result. We use this to calculate the changes in the perfusion pressure. And we calculate back the resistance on this axis the resistance for the normal voxel and the resistance for the voxel that had the biphasic response. So our data has come a long way from looking at CVR and just looking at the amplitude and whether there is steel, having two points and doing a simple regression. We can now, if we can now look at the speed of response. We can look at the strength of response and calculate back how strong that response is. And we can look at places where there's a shift in sensitivity. The take home message here is that all voxel resistance is reduced with hypercapnia. When you see a reduction in flow, that does not mean that there's an increase in resistance. Resistance only goes down with increase in PCO2. The, also, the changes in flow, the underlying flow, does not reflect the physiology of that voxel. It reflects the net flow from net changes in resistance throughout the brain. I'm now happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that great talk, Dr. Fisher. Um, are there any questions from any of the uh, panelists or the attendees? Um, um, I, I had one question, um, and that was, uh, if you have voxels where you have both a diminished uh, you know, capacity to uh, expand and a diminished response to CO2, is there a way to differentiate that? or? Is it more just getting you know pathological versus non-pathological, and that that's enough? Yes, I think you're right. I think at this point uh, it's probably more pathological and non-pathological. Uh, theoretically, uh, if you look at the midpoint of the of the sigmoid, if the midpoint is shifted right, it's there's a, a decrease in resistance. There's a decrease in sensitivity rather. Uh, if the midpoint is the same. The, the voxels that uh, have a weaker response, they tend to retain the same midpoints. So, uh, um, so we look at that midpoint to give us an idea of how to separate them off. Uh, and then the, the oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Blaze. I think. Oh, okay, I, I was just going to ask uh, another question. If you, uh, uh, I noticed that in the resting state, um, this is. Uh, you're only going over a very narrow range. What would happen if you did a resting state experiment in a an elevated CO2 act, uh, 
atmosphere or a decreased CO2 atmosphere? Would you be able to pull some of this apart or do you need to do the, the ramp, do you think? I, I think that uh, that if you just change the atmosphere, like I'm not sure what you mean, like if you change it long term, if, if somebody acclimatizes to a different uh, PCO2, different atmosphere, I think you'll probably get the same thing as uh, in baseline. If you just give a step change in, in uh, PCO2 uh, and then look at cold resting state, it's not really resting state. You've I think shifted the curve and over the short term that people would tolerate that in several minutes. Uh, I, I think you, you'll get neither nor. You know? okay. Yeah. I was just saying, because I, I have some data where people are breathing pure oxygen during resting state. And I was just wondering if it might be useful for this kind of thing. So. Yeah. Well, the pure oxygen is a respiratory stimulus. So right. what these people, so what you're looking at is the, is the uh, lower, uh, part of the uh, of the range. You're looking at the hypocapnic area. Whatever PCO2 they have, it's below what their normal resting value is. All right. Um, we've got a, a kind of live question by Paul Mullins. I'm just gonna, do you wanna ask your question, Paul? Yes, am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so very nice stuff. Um, so it points out that there, there's changes in resistance, but a key question I guess we're all interested in is what's caused the change in resistance? Some of it may be, as you said, a pathology um, such as atherosclerosis and other things, but are there other factors that can lead to a change in resistance that might be of interest to us to try and investigate? So looking, uh, looking into the pathophysiology of, of what's going on, so there's probably some amyloid angiopathy, whatever that is, you know, from a pathological point of view. And uh, there are certainly, there is certainly disease in the, uh, in the musculature, in the blood vessels, in, in their inability to respond quickly. They are, you know, we can see that they are abnormal. Uh, you know, we, we'd have to biopsy and look in and do all sorts of other uh, studies before we could get a better idea what the uh, core underlying pathophysiology is, but we can measure that they are no good. The vessels so, in various areas are, are slow. Uh, they are not responsive to changes in PCO2, whereas healthy vessels are snappy, as I showed. Uh, vessels, even with mild uh, disease, can be shown to be very slow. In our, when we looked at patients with Alzheimer's, for example, uh, their blood vessels had normal amplitude. It's just that they were very slow in response. There's something going on there, uh, something that, that will require a larger, broader scientific assault uh, before we can figure out. Just one follow-up to that, if I could. That's in that's true in pathology, and there has been other examples. Yeah, that's good. But my question is, do you think or do you know of other regions in the brain that may show similar differences in resistance or responsiveness without pathology, or without apparent pathology? So, for example, I've seen a recent report, the hippocampus, at least in mice, seems to have a differential response function during neuronal activity um, and the way the vessels respond. So I'm wondering, could this technique be useful? Could, you, could we look at it that way? Or are we just not, not quite fine enough with our resolution yet to get into those sorts of things? No, I think you are fine enough at the resolution. That's certainly, you know, what, what we've done is we've elucidated a principle. We can look at uh, differences in time response say in white matter and, and gray matter. So, you know, like big, big areas that are easy to look at and to average out. But uh, there's no reason why you can't uh, do the same thing, especially with, uh, with higher resolution imaging with uh, 70 or 90. Uh, there's probably no limit to, to what you can do. You can look at individual uh, areas in the brain. And uh, because you have a reproducibility, uh, the ability to, to reproduce these things, you can make yourself a normal atlas and go back and identify with, with uh, great precision uh, people who, uh, or organs, parts of the brain, areas that, that, uh, that 
move from, from the normal. You, you'll be able to identify abnormality with very easily. All right. Um, thank you so much. I think we, we need to move on to the next talk, but there are a few more questions um, that we will then address, I think, at the end of the session in the, in the longer discussion uh, session. So yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fisher again. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, um, so the, uh, uh, the next talk is on carbon dioxide, um, oxygen, and the cerebral um, circulation. And it will be given by um, Suktak Chan. Um, Dr. Suktak Chan received her PhD in uh, radiography and master's in information technology in uh, 1999 and 2006, respectively, um, both from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, she joined the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital in 2010. And before that, she was an assistant professor at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Her research interests include um, vascular physiology, respiratory physiology, and uh, cerebrovascular imaging using ultrasound and MRI. Hello, I'm Suktak Chen from Massachusetts General Hospital. You can call me Phoebe. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to talk at this symposium. Today, the topic of my talk is CO2-O2 and cerebral circulation. I'm going to present the recent work on my team on the association between CO2-O2 and cerebral hemodynamic changes at rest and under brachial charge. The details of our study were published in two papers. One of them focused on the resting state fluctuation, and the other is the responses to breath hold charge. So what is the motivation of our study? Hypercapnia is believed to be the dominant driver behind the modulation of cerebral blood flow, in short, we call CBF. One example is that the breath hold charge is often considered as hypercapnic charge. We usually use antidote CO2 to indicate a hypercapnic condition in the study of CBF changes. However, a previous study showed that mild hypercapnia and reduction in O2 could work synergistically to enhance CBF, a more significant response than hypercapnia alone. If both CO2 and O2 are involved in the CBF changes, since CO2 and O2 changes are highly correlated, a collinearity problem may happen if the separate dynamic changes of CO2 and O2 are included in the same analysis model, like the one used in the multiple regression analysis. Therefore, in our study, we use the parameter that incorporates both O2 and CO2 changes to correlate with the cerebral hemodynamic changes. The one we use is the breath by breath O2 CO2 exchange ratio. In short, we call BER. We investigate whether the breath by breath O2 CO2 exchange ratio is the more useful index than antidote CO2 to characterize cerebral hemodynamic fluctuation at rest and also cerebrovascular responses to breath of charge. Here, we elaborate more about the breath-by-breath O2-CO2 exchange ratio. We have the time series of a couple of respiratory gas exchange metrics here. In a study, we continuously measure the partial pressure of CO2 and O2. The envelopes are shown here. Entitled gas measurements are extracted at open circles, and n inspired gases are extracted at closed circles. Then we can calculate the magnitude changes of the partial pressure of the gases between N inspiration and N expiration within each breathing cycle. We call them delta PCO2 and delta PO2. The breath by breath O2 CO2 exchange ratio is the ratio of delta PO2 to delta PCO2. The time of breath is the duration of each breathing cycle. In the next three slides, we'll briefly elaborate on the physiological significance of these metrics. What is the physiological significance of BER? So we have to go through the time terminal back to the last century in the outbreak of the Second World War. 
At that time, there was an urgent demand for the, for the solution to deal with the problems faced by aviators flying at high altitudes in a non-pressurized aircraft. Professor Wallace Fan and his team members, Herman Rand and Arthur Otis, switched their efforts to respiratory physiology. One of the two important concepts resulting from their work is pulmonary gas exchange. They developed the O2-CO2 diagram of alveolar gas composition. The partial pressure of O2-CO2 and respiratory exchange ratio, indicated by Q here, are related to each other in alveolar gas equation. The respiratory exchange ratio is the ratio of the change in partial pressure of CO2 between inspiration and expiration divided by the change in the partial pressure of O2. BER is mathematically equivalent to the reciprocal of the respiratory exchange ratio. We have two physiological terms here. The respiratory exchange ratio, RER, developed by Wallace Fan and his team, and the other is respiratory quotient, RQ, which appeared more than a century ago. The respiratory quotient is metabolic-oriented. It is the ratio of CO2 production to O2 consumption in intermediate cellular metabolism. Those values depend on substrate mixture that is being oxidized. The respiratory exchange ratio is based on gas measurement, the ratio of CO2 output to O2 uptake in the lungs. At rest, the values of RQ and RER are very similar to each other. A homeostatic regulatory system is formed with arterial partial pressure of O2 and CO2 as regulated variables. Peripheral and central chemoreceptors as sensors, brings them as the control center, diaphragm and respiratory muscles as effectors to optimize systemic blood gases. Arterial partial pressure of O2 and CO2 sensed by chemoreceptor are maintained within the range around the physiological set point, that is the mean, by the feedback control of the diaphragm and respiratory muscles for ventilation in the system. Spontaneous breathing is part of this vital homeostatic process to optimize the systemic blood gases, presumably regulating CBF and O2 delivery to the brain. Coming back to our study, the healthy subjects included in our study do not have a history of neurological disorder, mental and psychiatric disorders, and drug abuse. We have two measurements for the CBF related hemodynamic changes. We measure the changes in cerebral blood flow velocity in the middle cerebral arteries using transcranial double ultrasound and the both signal changes using functional MRI. Transcranial double ultrasound has the high temporal resolution, but the measurements confined to two arteries at the time. fMRI has the high spatial resolution to study regional changes, but the temporal resolution is relatively low. We scan the subject in three different conditions, resting state, under breathal change, and exogenous CO2 challenge. Here are the paradigms for the two challenges. Each condition lasts 10 minutes. I'm going to split the results and discussion into two parts. The first part focuses more on the changes of respiratory gas exchange metrics. And the second part focuses more on the correlation of respiratory gas exchange metrics with the cerebral hemodynamic change. We look at some features in the respiratory gas exchange metrics. We compare the values of delta PO2 and delta PCO2 here, 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 and here in the resting state and under breathful charge. In both conditions, we notice that the magnitude changes of delta PO2 are often larger than those of delta PCO2. Here we show the correlation among the respiratory gas exchange metrics at rest and under breath hole charge. In both conditions, BER correlates more with the delta PO2 than with delta PCO2. We show the time series of cerebral hemodynamic fluctuations at rest 
cerebrovascular responses to breathal change and their corresponding respiratory gas exchange metrics in representative subjects. We'll look at the time series at resting state first. The thick line in green is entitled O2, and the thick line in blue is entitled CO2. The entitled measurements of two gases oscillate out of phase. For the delta PO2 and delta PCO2, they oscillate in phase. We can see that the ventilatory fluctuation cause the momentary drop of delta PO2 and delta PCO2. Then we look at the time series of BER. The effect of ventilatory fluctuation is significantly reduced. There is the slow oscillation with the duration of each cycle about 2 minutes, which is about 0.008 Hz. The changes of BER follow closely with the changes in CBFV and both signals. When we look at the changes of respiratory gas exchange metrics under breathal charge, we find that the end-tidal CO2 increases with the decrease in end-tidal O2 during breath holding. The time of breath during breath holding increases. BER Delta PO2, Delta PCO2 increased during breath holding. Again, the changes of BER follow closely with the changes in CBFV and both signals during under the breath of charge. Our findings of the changes in respiratory gas exchange metrics at rest are consistent with the results reported in previous studies. Two papers from the Zhu and Nefong specifically reported the time series of breath-by-breath -breath variation of pulmonary gas exchange at rest in human. Both of them show that entitled O2 here vary more than the entitled CO2. The breath-by-breath -breath respiratory gas exchange ratio correlated more with the entitled O2 than with entitled CO2. They found a slow oscillation between 25 to 50 breaths in the time series of respiratory gas exchange metric, which is around 0.005 to 0.01 Hz. Both of them suggested that this oscillatory pattern is related to the continual change in the distribution of the ventilation perfusion ratio. Many previous breath hold studies also show that delta PO2 decreased during breath holding and the rate of decrease in alveolar PO2 was much larger than the increase in alveolar PCO2. Therefore, the respiratory exchange ratio, RDR, decreased. Remember, BER is the reciprocal of RDR. The decrease of RDR during breath holding shown in this study is equivalent to the increase in BER. Here is the second part of the results in discussion. We use the wavelet transform coherence analysis to study how the respiratory gas exchange metrics oscillate with cerebral hemodynamic changes at rest and under breath hold charge. If the two time series oscillate together, the coherence will increase, and the offset of the oscillation determines the phase difference. The graphs on the right show the time average coherence at different frequency bandwidth and phase lengths. Take this as an example. Here we have the time series of BER and changes in CBFV in the resting state and under breathal charge. By visual inspection, there is no wonder that they have the pretty strong coherence, that is, BER oscillate with CBFV. And the strong coherence happened in the frequency range from 0.008 to 0.03 Hz at the phase lag of 0 to pi over 2. Here are the group results. The top rows are the coherence of respiratory gas exchange metrics, BER, delta PO2, and delta PCO2 with the CBFV changes in the TCD sessions. The bottom rows are the coherence of respiratory gas exchange metrics with both signal changes in MR session. The results in the resting state are on the left and the results under breathal charge are on the right. We find two features here. 
the three metrics BER, delta PO2, and delta PCO2 have increased coherence with CBFV and bow signal changes in the frequency range of 0.008 to 0.03 Hz. BER indicated by the black lines has the strongest coherence with CBFV and bow signal changes. Here we use linear regression analysis to study the association between regional bow signal changes and respiratory gas exchange metrics in individual subjects and then proceed with the group analysis. We compare the group results from the resting state, the breathal charge, with those under exogenous CO2 charge. Linear regression is an analysis approach that is commonly used in cerebrovascular reactivity CVR assessment. For exogenous CO2 charge data, we regress the both signal changes on the entitled CO2 changes. The coefficient of regression, beta, that is the percent both signal change per unit change of the regressor, here is the entitled CO2, quantifies the strength of association. It is also used to quantify CVR. In addition to the beta coefficient for each subject, we also calculate the percentage of voxels in each region, having a significant association between both signal change and change in regressor. They are referred to as voxel with beta or VCVR in this slide. We apply the same analysis to the data acquired when the subjects are at rest and under breathal charge. The regressor used in resting state analysis are BER, delta PO2, and delta PCO2. The regressor used in breath hole analysis are entitled CO2, time of breath, and BER. These three metrics are chosen to present here because entitled CO2 and time of breath are commonly considered vasoactive stimuli in breath hole cerebrovascular reactivity study. In both resting state and breath hole charge, the association between both signal changes and BER is the strongest among all the respiratory gas exchange metrics. The brain map generated by regressing both signal changes on BER at rest or under breath hole charge resemble those by regressing both signal changes on entitled CO2 under exogenous CO2 charge. Specifically for resting state data, we compare the grip connectivity maps and the grip ring maps of the association between both signal changes and the three respiratory gas exchange metrics, BER, delta PO2, and delta PCO2. We use the NEF precuneus as the seat in the connectivity analysis because we want to use it to outline the default mode network. Since it is the comparison with brain connectivity, we confine this part of the analysis to gray matter. We find that the brain regions with the significant association between BER and both signal changes overlap with many areas of the default mode network outlined by connectivity analysis. The coherence between respiratory gas exchange metrics and cerebral hemodynamic changes increases in a very low frequency range of 0.008 to 0.03 Hz. The show and the form suggest that this slow oscillation may be related to the ventilation perfusion ratio. Oscillation of the same frequency range were also reported in the brain light B waves and in the peripheral circulation. B waves have been reported to be related to the spontaneous oscillation in intracranial pressure. Among all the respiratory gas exchange metrics, the coherence between BER and cerebral hemodynamic changes is the strongest. The coherence of the cerebral hemodynamic changes is stronger with delta PO2 than with delta PCO2. This is consistent with the findings from Auslitz's team that arterial oxygen content is correlated with the change in CDL. In our study, we find that the brain regions with the significant association between BER and cerebral hemodynamic changes overlap with many regions of the default mode network. 
It may be related to the higher metabolic and hemodynamic activities in the brain regions within the default mode network than the other parts of the cortex at rest. The brain maps generated by regressing both signal changes on BDR instead of entitled CO2 at rest or under breathal charge resemble those by regressing both signal changes on entitled CO2 under exogenous CO2 charge. In the resting state, both O2 and CO2 are continuously optimized to the set point in the homeostatic regulatory system. Holding breath creates a closed circuit with continual systemic consumption of O2 and production of CO2. Both resting state and breath holding involve the changes of endogenous gases, which is different from the exogenous CO2 charge, where a gas mixture with increased CO2 but ambient O2 is the minister. At this point, you may have the question, if both increase in entitled CO2, that is hypercapnia, and decrease in entitled O2, that is hypoxia, induce an increase in CDF, why don't we use the product of delta P CO2 and delta PO2? Then we have to go back to the time series of the entitled measurements of O2 and CO2. Entitled O2 and entitled CO2 oscillate out of phase, but the delta PO2 and delta PCO2 oscillate in phase. The product of delta PCO2 and delta PO2 will exaggerate the effect of ventilatory fluctuations in the time series, which reduces the correlation with CDLV changes. The second question, the inspired gases do not have physiological value since they are constant in the ambient and condition. Why don't we use the ratio of entitled CO2 to entitled O2? According to our findings, the inspired partial pressure of O2 has physiological value. The ratio taken from the entitled measurements is different from the ratio of delta PO2 to delta PCO2. We can explain it with the respiratory exchange ratio, RER, in the alveolar gas equation. In the ideal situation, if O2 intake is equal to CO2 release, RER is equal to 1. However, in reality, O2 intake is often larger than CO2 release at rest. Many studies, including ours, show this difference. That means less CO2 is added to alveolar air than O2 drawn from alveolus. Since pressure must equilibrate, nitrogen will then compensate for the pressure differences. Therefore, there is a correction factor next to the inspired partial pressure of O2. Here, we show the differences between BDR and the ratio of entitled measurements of CO2 to O2 in their correlation with CBRV. Remember that the entitled measurements oscillate out of phase. Taking the ratio of entitled measurements will exaggerate the effect of ventilatory fluctuations. In addition, the ratio of this ratio drops quickly immediately after breath holding, which is different from BDR and CBRV changes. On the right, we show the correlation of BDR and the ratio of entitled CO2 to O2 with CBRV changes. The correlation of entitled CO2 to O2 with CBRV reduces significantly. Delta PCO2 can be, can be simplified as entitled CO2 with the minimal level of ambient CO2, but the delta PO2 cannot be simplified as entitled O2. Conclusion, no frequency oscillation of the range between 0.008 to 0.03 Hz in CBF-related hemodynamic changes correlate with the oscillation of BDR at rest. The coupling between BDR and CBF-related hemodynamic changes is strongest at default mode network for healthy subjects. Change in BDR is more related to the change in O2 uptake than to the change in CO2 release. BER in comparison with entitled CO2 is a more robust regressor in the analysis of cerebral hemodynamic fluctuation at rest and also cerebral vascular responses to breathal charge. Significance 
Our findings provide a novel insight on the brain-body interaction between respiratory gas exchange and cerebral hemodynamic changes in healthy and disease status. The coupling between BVR and cerebral hemodynamic changes offers an alternative approach to correlate with the cerebral hemodynamic fluctuations during spontaneous breathing or with the cerebral vascular responses to breath hole change for the CVR assessment. Here are the references. I would like to thank my team members, Carl, Chengyi, Juliet, Andre, Andrew, Bruce, and Ken from Martino Center, and Yongping from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. This study is not possible without their support. I would also like to thank the funding support from NIH. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chan, for that uh, really interesting uh, talk. Um, do we have any questions from, from the, uh, the speakers or the panelists or the organizers and the uh, attendees? Go ahead, Jean. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, so hi, Phoebe. Uh, good to see you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. And um, I would first like to say that your finding of the frequency signature for the CO2 fluctuation is generally consistent with what we've been finding in our resting state work and also the role of the default mode network. It is a very particular network uh, when it comes to vascular effects. Um, so my question is about the hemodynamic response. So if you're looking at the velocity of flow, it's one thing, but looking at the bolt signal, um, so the bolt signal has this particular hemodynamic response when it comes to CO2. I suspect when it comes to O2, the response will be slightly different. So in our resting state analyses, if we directly regressed CO2 against um, the bolt signal, we found very poor uh, association, so we had to tag on the, the response function. Um, so what is your sense in terms of having a, involving a response function and help with that implies for your results? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. So uh, we actually um, uh, say, um, because in our study, we focus looking at the uh, at the correlation of different gases um, with the bow response and also the CBRV. So uh, we did try to use the respiratory response function and then convolve with the, with the CO2 uh, separately with uh, O2 to correlate with the, with the bow. But um, you know, for the response function, it will be the same. So even if we convolve with the same response function, we get the same results. So response function is only say you turning in one part, but uh, if we are talking about say correlating with the bow and CBRV, so using the same response function, it will not change the results a lot. I see. So the, the mechanism of inducing change in the bolt signal is equivalent for O2 and CO2, basically. That's what um, this is implying like timing wise, because the response function can sometimes have a negative lobe and that can imply that the, the, the product that convolution will be flipped. Um, so I noticed also that your regression map did not include any negative values. So if you were to have a response function with a significant negative um, lobe, would that imply, would, so, so did you try that to see if you do get negative associations? So with again, both. what you mentioned about negative response function for the oxygen is that you are mentioning, you, you are looking at the entire uh, measurement of the oxygen, right? So, um, so if we are lo uh, we also look at, in, the, in our recent posture in the ISMRM, we also look at the um, regression with the entire O2. And then we compare with um, uh, the, uh, the correlation of the entire O2 uh, with the bow and then compared with the um, anti-CO2 with the bow. And then we find that there is the, um, say, anti-CO2 is more stable than anti-CO2, I can tell. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, Ben, you, you, your hand is raised, I think. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, 
Yeah, sure. So thanks, Phoebe. That's awesome stuff. I noticed in one of your slides where you you've got the, um, the resting state data on the left and the breath hold data on the right. I looked at the fluctuations in the breath hold exchange and I was it was curious that during the resting state, the first half of the experiment was very, very smooth, right around one. And then in the second half, there was a big oscillation. It went up to you know, between like 0.7 and 1.4, I think it was, almost as big as the breath hold. So then I was like, okay, what's why is that driving it? And if you look at the uh, end tidal O2, especially, and the CO2, it suggests that they're actually relatively shallow breathing in the second half of the experiment, or maybe just slow breathing. So maybe they're taking big sighs, like they're getting sleepy. So I'm curious, what does that imply for the way that we might do? Yes, that slide. Yeah, look at that right, that right there on top left. So look at the breath hole exchange there in the in the dotted left, the dotted uh, red box. It suddenly oscillates an awful lot, and there's that that would be really interesting. I mean, there's there's clearly much more predictive power when you have a big fluctuation in in your uh, driving function. So I'm curious to, to know, you know, what is it the subject is doing during that second half of the experiment that makes that big fluctuation? And is it exploitable? The reason I ask that is because in the, in the lag analysis that we've been doing with Blaze, we've been trying to not do breath holds, but uh, like a task-free uh, uh, experiment where we break the cyclic breathing by <sighs> periodic size. And then you tend to find if you just monitor your own breathing, you then don't breathe for 10 or 15 seconds afterwards. You essentially get an, you know, a full expiration breath hold uh, for free, as it were. So I'm curious, is that what you're seeing here or something else? So what you mentioned about this, the, the resting state is the second, um, the third, um, the third graph from the top, right? That's right, exactly. Yes. So um, so basically for those two um um so th those two dippings is actually based on the ventilatory fluctuations. So they actually say how this say after a while in the scanner, most of the people they they try to say they have the, the, the momentary deep breaths. So that can be avoided. And in the patients, it's even more severe, the situation. So um, so one good thing I can tell is that if we measure the entire, um, if we do the entire measurement, and even for the delta measurement, we can see that this kind of the effect of the ventilatory uh, fluctuation, it cannot be avoided. But uh, after we derive the VER, um, this ventilatory fluctuation is um, greatly reduced. So it is a more stable regressor to correlate with the, with the blood flow. Because um, you have, um, so you have one single ventilatory fluctuation, but it affects both. So once you have the uh, delta PO2 and delta PCO2, if they oscillate in phase, then they will cancel out each other. Yeah. So hopefully in your case is that after you have the breath hole and then with the um, second type of the of the change, then you don't have that huge um, ventilatory fluctuation that cannot be canceled out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again, Dr. Chen. Uh, if there are any other questions, we can we can address them in the uh, in the discussion after uh, the end of the session. Um, and yeah, and then we'll kind of move on to the next uh, talk, the last talk of the session uh, on neurovascular coupling. Um, this talk will be given by Dr. Celine Matteo. She's an assistant project scientist in the physics department at the University of California, San Diego. Um, she's been working with uh, David Kleinfeld, um, where she took a particular uh, interest in the control of blood flow um, by neuronal activity. Um, she obtained her PhD from the um, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, where she uh, worked on the uh, modulation of synaptic transmission by, by uh, brain states. Um, and uh, now I hand over to you, uh, Celine, uh, Dr. Matteo. I think you're you're muted. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Do you see my slide? Yep. It's good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about the work I did during my postdoc, and uh, it's going to be a little different from what we've seen today, uh, mostly because all the experiments are done in mice. 
And um, the, the aim of my work was to try to uh, understand how we get to the bold signal, uh, what are the um, uh, what are the microscopic changes that allow to uh, to get the signal? And so, uh, first, I'd like to. Um, I mean, all of you are actually like familiar with it, but uh, I'd like to talk about the slow oscillations of oxygen that are the signature of uh, the resting state in uh, bold fMRI. And like one of the first measurements here done by Biswall, where you show the slow fluctuation here of the oxygenation in the tissue. And uh, you can see the magnitude here with the frequency, it's like under 0.2 Hertz. And one interesting thing here is to see the position here. So this is already an indicator in humans in, um, in opposite hemispheres at the same location uh, where we see a correlation in time. If we now look at the activation map, we can see that areas get activated in, um, uh, in both hemispheres at the same time when you have visual perception or space cognition or auditory or speech execution, as you see here. And if you compare this activation map with now the spontaneous map of resting state correlation, you can see that you have uh, something that is pretty similar. So during resting states, you have functionally connected areas that are actually uh, changing the oxygen level at the same time. So this is what we see here with the PO2 level changing with fMRI, which is uh, known and like the correlation between the both sides that you see here. And keep in mind that this graph here at the bottom is gonna evolve during the talk. Um, another thing that we know is correlated between uh, areas that are uh, functionally connected together is the GABA rhythm. So this is a paper from near here in uh, humans using local field potential. This is one of my favorite paper and like getting two electrodes and like two spots at the same time and recording uh, the local field potential. And what they show here is that the gamma rhythm is actually correlated between the two um, uh, the two sides. And what's important is that it's the envelope of the gamma rhythm, not the like uh, little oscillations that are changing, the envelope and the amplitude of the gamma rhythm itself. And so here we're still talking about the low frequencies that are observed during resting state fMRI. So we have an oscillatory uh, phenomenon of gamma band power here at low frequency that is correlated between uh, functionally connected areas. So how do we bridge that now with the bold signal? And so that's a very interesting experiment here done um, in uh, fMRI. And we have the bold signal oscillating here on the LFP spectrogram. And what was shown is that we had the highest uh, correlation being on the gamma band. So the gamma band could be responsible for the increase in, uh, in uh, fMRI. But what we wanted to address in the mouse where we have actually access to a lot of microscopic uh, phenomenon is like, what allows us to have as this ultra slow frequency, a link between the gamma band power and the increase in oxygenation. And our, our hypothesis is that uh, it is the slow oscillation of arterial dilation that would be the candidate to link the increase of neuronal activity with a fluctuation of oxygen. And this is what the presentation is gonna be about and uh, what we're gonna be researching. Oh, one major thing that we did is working with awake mice, contrary to a lot of the field that has been working with anesthetized mice for a while. And one of the reasons for that is to decrease the effect of anesthetics on uh, the um, uh, on the vasculature. Another reason is that it's actually more convenient in the long run and you can use your uh, preparation 
in uh, for a longer time. And so this is the uh, example of preparation that we've been using in the lab. It's called a fin skull window. So what we do is we take um, the mouse, we remove the skin and, uh, and now we shave the bone, but do not open the actual bone. We just have it as thin as can be, cover it with a, a glue and a cover glass for uh, index matching. And uh, we can keep that preparation for a while. And what you see here is a scanning, uh, how we can obtain very fast recording of a vessel uh, diameter just by scanning into photon microscopy uh, in the awake mouse across these vessels. And what uh, Pat Drew actually showed in the lab uh, uh, previously was that we can observe in a mouse in the arteries. So the reddish, like the hot traces here are all like little arteries and they correspond to the uh, cross on the path. What you see is that uh, you have slow oscillation of arterial diameter. And this are like around uh, 0.1 Hertz, I can see on the spectral. What's interesting, and there was a question previously of what happens to the vein. In this case, the veins do not dilate. And so that's actually something I'd like to claim right now is like, and the many years I've been doing that, the only way we got the veins to really dilate is by really large stimulation. So like most of the effect here is all going through the arteries. So there's a phenomenon called the arterial basal motion, which happens in our arteries when they're isolated. And they also happen in periphery as well as in the brain. And they are a slow oscillation uh, inferior to 0.2 hertz of arterial diameter. And what we're gonna try to see here is that, can we entrain that, um, at the, at the arterial diameter? So we've got three questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, can the neuronal activity entrain vasomotion? motion? And does it change the local PO2? And finally, can we actually reproduce the, um, the changes that you see when you um, make a resting state maps using bold fMRI, just looking at the vessels? Okay, the question one, uh, we are looking at the uh, link between the gamma band power here and the arterial diameter. So to do so, we start by a correlative approach where we have a synchronous measurement of the arterial diameter with the local field potential. So again, we use two photon uh, imaging to see the vessel. And now we have inserted LFP electrodes at the same time to be able to uh, chronically record this mouse. And the result is the following. So you can see the LFP spectrogram on top and we've isolated the gamma band power here. And if you compare now the gamma band power also has the slow uh, fluctuation like we could see before in the human and the diameter of a vessel is also oscillating and you see a really good match. So let me convince you with a correlation here where you see the correlation here. So it's all spontaneous activity. There is no stimulation here. And you can see an increase in correlation. And the peak here is around two seconds, as you can see here also across mice. And so the gamma band changes the arterial diameter, or at least is happening before. And just to be preemptive, because I know that a lot of you are interested in the different frequencies, the gamma band power showed to be the one that was the most predictive of what was gonna happen with uh, uh, the correlation uh, with neuronal activity. And here we're just showing the, um, the distribution of a coherence between uh, uh, 0.05 and 0.15 in between the blood flow and the, um, and the actual uh, band. So one thing that is important is that correlation is not causality. So now we know they're linked, but does it mean that the neuronal activity is in training of this emotion? So let's test if it can. And one way to test that is to actually change neuronal activity artificially in a pattern that looks like burst of 
uh, gamma activity. And for this, we designed a paradigm where we are stimulating the neurons at the gamma frequency, but now the amplitude of the gamma frequency is controlled by the amplitude of the light. And the way we can do that is by using a phi one channel redox in mouse uh, where uh, neurons are activated by light. And what we see at the bottom here is that the light is able to then uh, change the gamma activity, the envelope again, very important, and uh, induce dilation as you can see here. To convince you, here is the average here. You can see the increase of gamma cre created by the, uh, by the light and the effect of the depolarization of the neurons. And here, the arterial diameter, which follows. And again, we are keeping our two second lag. And we can see that not only can we uh, entrain at 0.1 hertz, but we can also entrain at different frequencies, but it's a little lower when you go up uh, in another range. Um, there was also the issue that when dilating vessels and particular endothelial cells can be responsible of the secretion of NON. There has been experiment showing that changing the vessel diameter uh, in slices could change the neuronal activity. So we went in and decided like, okay, let's make sure to see um, if the vessel has an effect on the vasc on the outer, um, ah, sorry on the neuronal activity in our hands. And what we did is uh, we used a mouse that expressed halorhodopsin and smooth muscle and using our two photon technique again and uh, putting a, a yellow light through the objective, we could see that when we stimulate in that particular spot, it's a very focal stimulation, we can see an increase on target of, of uh, um, of the diameter due to light. This is not via the neurons, this is directly by relaxation of the smooth muscle. Now we can compare what happens with and without light. So this is what happened in this mouse naturally. You see you've got a um, the gamma band here and diameter in red and a fairly good correlation. Now, if you uh, artificially create these emotions, you can see that you have a decoupling. And this is something you can see here on these graphs uh, where you see that when there's no light, you've got a fairly high coherence that drops in the presence of the light. And this is the simulation that is off target, which uh, shows that you have a higher response. It's just to test this, uh, the uh, specificity. So here, if you have an artificial basal motion, you're not anymore coherent with the uh, uh, electrical activities. So that kind of tells you that you're not entraining the gamma band using, uh, uh, using the uh, arterial diameter. So we answered our question one, that the ultra low frequency variation in the envelope of a gamma ribbon entrain vasomotion. motion. So does that change the PO2 level? And I think there was a question previously about that. And uh, here we use intrinsic optical imaging and the same prep kind of preparation. We have a window. We now have also our uh, electrodes for LFP and we have different lights uh, on top of the mouse uh, to uh, measure the diameter, the HB and the HBO. And using the blue light diameter, we're gonna measure the um, changes in diameter. And we're also going to measure uh, HB and HBO using uh, different lights. And what we saw using this uh, imaging modality of intrinsic imaging is we still have the changing gamma band. The arterial diameter is still fluctuating. And now we also observe the changes in PO2 and, uh, and HB. And that's that's. That's what is going to uh, be responsible for the bolt signal later. And what we see is in terms of timing, we have a delay of roughly 0.7 seconds and uh, the, diameter uh, the diameter increase happened before the changes in HBO and HBO2. 
So what we can see is that the arterial dilation precedes the increase in local PO2. And now we get to our last question, which is, can we now change uh, on both sides the arterial diameter in, uh, in narrowed area? So if you want to see something as small as an arterial in a mouse, which is around like 20 micrometer, and you want to see it on both sides of the brain, it's nice to have a two photon microscope that can go on both sides. And this is what uh, Phil Tsai in the lab uh, developed with uh, the help of uh, uh, Schaefer and Phil, and what we have is this kind of image. So this mouse here is awake. We have done a full cortical mantle window. So now we, the, and the brain is still not exposed. This is only thin skull window. And we have filled the vasculature with FITSI, which is what we did for the rest of the experiment. I did not notice it. And now we image the fluorescence on both sides of the brain at the same time in the awake mouse. And you have here the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and we're trying to go in areas that are correlated to each other. So just really mirrored compared to the midline. And here the separation is 5.5 millimeter. The longest we could do was like, I think seven uh, millimeter. You also have to take the curvature into account. And so the measurements are between the both sides, but also in the same side to see uh, how things are compared to each other in uh, with distance. So here we've got the right hemisphere in purple and the left hemisphere in green. And we can see a really nice correlation between these two functionally correlated area. And uh, a little more statistics here. So if we look about the opposite hemisphere, we are, we've seen as we showed previously that we have a high coherence. But if we now look at the same hemisphere, we can see that, so that's the vessel to vessel distance here. Yeah? So the coherence is really high when you're um, very close. And if vessels are further away from each other, the coherence is dropping and it's dropping to the point of not being significant anymore around like 1.5 and like, two millimeter. And so that is pretty important in like defining like the, um, the precision you could have with any kind of fMRI even in mice, because if your vessel is still dilated that far, is it still gonna be able to um, uh, measure the neural activity properly? To address now, uh, if the chasm that is the link between both areas is important in the role of the coordination, we um, the first thing we did is actually cut the corpus callosum. So cutting the corpus callosum in such a preparation uh, has actually not led to really good results. Uh, one of the things that happens is you get bleeding and it's really not convenient. So we moved to another model with an achalosal mouse. And in this case, uh, we are decreasing the gamma band power and now looking at what happens to the arterial diameter. And so we did the exact same experiment as before. Now we're comparing it between um, the mouse that is achalosal and the mouse that is um, wild type. And so we look across the midline and measure from mirror side and so here distance being zero means you are exactly in the same area, but on the other side. And what we see here with the distance from mirror side, we are on the other side here. So the, uh, the pink are the uh, wild type mice. And we see that they have a higher coherence than the achalosal mice would have. And so that is telling us that the gamma band is actually through the corpus callosum plays a role in uh, the correlation between both uh, hemispheres. So finally, we showed that um, the gamma band power can change the arterial diameter and the timing is two seconds. And the arterial diameter can change the PO2 level at the 0.7 
seconds. And finally, that could explain the fMRI signal. And uh, this is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Sorry, that was just. Yeah. Sorry. No, please continue. Oh, sorry. Did you want to say anything? Uh, no, no, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mateo, for that uh, great uh, talk. Um, yes, there are quite a few questions. Uh, let me pick out the first one. Um, so, um, one question was about the. Um, the uh, relaxation of the artery due to, to light, uh, whether that could have been a heat effect, uh, like a heating effect? Uh, oh, uh, so uh, for the uh, stimulation, so we've done a similar experiment. So was that for the relaxation of a, we did two types, we did the control with a blue light and the yellow light, and uh, we have a control with Sheffing on the, in the paper, showing that the intensity we're using, we're not causing, uh, large dilation, there is a little bit, there, there's, there's something, this really, really small for some of the experiment, but in general, we, uh, we, we don't have a, a, a large uh, stimulation. We don't have a large artifact, which we, we tested it because we also did the controls in wild type mice. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Artur had uh, his hand raised, uh, but it's not raised anymore. Um, let me see if I can find you and then I can, uh, oh, it seems like he's not, uh, he's no longer in the meeting. Can't find him at least, but we can move on to the next question. If he joins again, then he can, um, can ask his question. Um, so Ioannis uh, has, a, has a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Selena. I mean, I'm always sort of impressed by, by the work uh, that's sort of been done at the micro level. I think, one, one sort of pattern that I, that I saw was that, um, as I was also like sort of reading through the, is that the, the sort of coherence is, is, is kind of capped, right? It's not, you know, it's not perfect at like 0.9. I mean, at least- Oh, no, the, no, no, it's not perfect, no. So, so do you think that there is sort of other, um, you know, above and beyond sort of, you know, basal interactions that can explain the residual sort of variance and, in these, you know, are there sort of other intrinsic, you think, reasons for, oh, let me lower my hand. Um, are there any other sort of in, in, in increasing sources of, um, you know, noise, I guess, that can sort of drive the remaining interactions between that? What is your, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on sort of like the remaining, I guess, um, variants? I think we're gonna see a lot of that today. And I think like, what is, uh, what is considered as noise in human, it's really likely to also be here in a mouse. And um, the um, w one of the things that happened, and I think you can see that in the, like uh, when we do the coherence at the end, is that you have a two millimeter like distance where you have the correlation between vessels, but you don't necessarily have that in LFP. You can have already a, a change in neural activity if you look at two electrodes that are two millimeter apart. So one of the things that happens is that your neuronal activity has such a higher resolution than your vessel. So that's already gonna cause uh, interaction between areas and uh, create uh, a decrease in the, um, in the correlation. Uh, the other thing is movement. Uh, so if your mouse moves, uh, you do get dilation. One of the things though is like, we're studying in the uh, somatosensory cortex. So that also could be, um, a response that is uh, still physiological because you have also increased in neuronal activity, but uh, there's a chance that just just that could be sufficient to uh, uh, decorrelate. And also, there's the spontaneous basal motion that we entrain, but it's still there. So if you don't have neuronal activity, then you still have the frequency. It's not being entrained by by the neuronal activity, so you can have a non coupling here. So I, I think the point here is to say like, it is linked, but it's not all of it. Right. Thank you very much. Brilliant. All right. And then we have kind of uh, two related questions that I'm going to just merge into, into one question. Um, 
uh, one question was um, your light stim stimulation for entraining the arterial uh, vasomotion was at 30 hertz. Um, did you try other frequencies in the in the gamma range? And then similarly, um, someone asked uh, that you kind of define gamma maybe as a kind of a broad range between 30 and 80 um, hertz. Um, does it make sense to kind of narrow it down? Uh, and this person mentioned the Logothetis paper in monkeys um, that demonstrated the peak at about 70 um, hertz. Um, so so what do you think about that? What do you think about the kind of within the gamma range? The uh, So the to be honest, I didn't look too much inside the gamma range. Oh. I, uh, I, um, I mean, we have a full spectrum, but I mostly uh, looked at the full spectrum as a whole. Uh, for the gamma band, but the truth is there's already like a large correlation with most of the bands, uh, except I think delta, uh, but like the, the highest correlation being for delta, and uh, we did not uh, separate uh, the bands like um, like uh, Nikos Lokotred is dead, uh, so I can't uh, answer that question. One thing I did though is uh, when uh, stimulating with uh, channel rhodopsin, uh, I did change the frequency. Uh, the and, uh, oh, the stimulation. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. And uh, and we still get uh, vasodilation. Okay. Um, then uh, we've got another question. Um, uh, does the coherent frequency differ at all between normal and acolosal mice, or is the interaction between uh, near infrared light and the mitochondria, or oh, I think that's a different question. Okay, does the coherence frequency differ at all between normal and acolosal mice? Um, uh, you mean on the spectrum? Um, yes, I think that's what what's meant by this question. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I um, hmm. Okay, I don't recall large differences. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, then we have um, Paul Mullins has uh, his hand up. I'll just uh, allow you to speak. Oh, sorry, I think I, yeah. Can, can you ask your question now, Paul? Yes, yeah. so um, it was really, it's again with the acolosal mice. So you show yes. that there's a decrease in the coherence across the hemispheres. Mm -hmm. But is that coherence still somewhat significant? Yes. So there's yes, obviously some is. other mechanism for there are some coordinating other signal. Yeah, yeah, which you would also expect in a mouse that is actually like it was born without, so most likely there is compensatory effect. We also think that there's no modulation in inputs to our similar areas that are involved, and so it tells us that you know. The link for the corpus callosum is contributing to uh, the um, the changes, but that we also have uh, other mechanism. You also have the uh, if I'm remembering well, right? The interior commissure is still there, so um, there are still areas that are connected to each other on the on the bilateral uh, level. All right, um, thank you. And I think we can we can kind of move on from, well, directly from that last mm -hmm. question to, to the discussion, the longer discussion um, session. Um, and so maybe we'll start from the, from the top, from the very first uh, lecture. Um, is Dr. Wittenstahl still there uh, actually, or? Yes, I'm here. Just, oh yeah, oh, thank you. Um, and then, and then we'll we'll go through the um, the lectures kind of chronologically. And if if any of the participants or the um, the speakers have any questions, please just um, put them either into the chat or into the uh, Q and A window. So um, just uh, yes. Oh, so I think we had actually covered um, all the questions from the first talk. Again, if there's any more, just put them into the uh, into the. Uh, the Q and A window or the chat. Um, so one question was for the uh, the, the second talk, um, Dr. Fisher. Um, the question says, in the stenosis subjects where you did not see um, a blue brain, so 
the voxels that were marked uh, blue kind of, um, how easy was it to later identify the collateral flow in uh, the MR angiogram? Or did you see that basically in the MR angiogram? Yeah, well, <clears throat> we look hard and uh, whatever it is, it's not gonna be one large vessel that uh, you can identify the flow. Uh, my, my first three slides <laughs> after the intro slide was to give you an idea why it's impossible just to do an angiogram because the, the different pathways are, are multiple. And, um, and they're all tiny, so they don't have enough resolution to be visualized. And, um, and it's, it's a kind of physiological thing rather than a bulk flow. So that answers the question, yeah. Yeah. So as in, um, basically what you mean by the resolution is like um, it, to, to assess like the pile collaterals or something. So not the, the collaterals within the circle of Willis that you can depict by angiography, but like the, the leptomeningeal. Right. Okay. Right. And they're not necessarily uh, vessels that are neovasculature like in Moya Moya that develop. And even those that develop are, are small and tortuous and, and very difficult to follow. But these would be even smaller vessels. It would be kind of functional uh, collateral flow rather than uh, in, in uh, pathways that you can identify. I see. Okay. Um, so the, the other, uh, another question is, uh, given that lengthy CO2 stimulation opens up all vessels, should, be a, should there be an upper limit to the time duration of CO2 administration? Um, yeah, I, under certain circumstances, you might think of that if the patient comes in and, um, and has ischemia, uh, recently developed ischemia, uh, it, it is not unreasonable to worry that if you dilate other parts, that the ischemic parts will become worse. So uh, I think that one would avoid that in a patient who comes in and is uh, acutely ill. One has to think about it as to whether that that is uh, that that may make the patient worse. But other than that, um, the hypercapnia seems to be in stable patients. Hypercapnia seems to be well tolerated. Uh, of all the people whose pictures I see here and all the panelists, uh, probably about 70% of them have high PCO2s while they sleep, uh, many of them for prolonged periods of time and accompanied by hypoxia, some severe hypoxia, worse than, than uh, PO2s of 40 and so on. And yet here they are in little pictures, little icons throughout my screen. So, um, I, I think that uh, it's not a common experience that the uh, hypercapnia causes any uh, physiological damage, certainly not reversible. And people have studied this very carefully in all sorts of organs for permissive hypercapnia in intensive care units. And these are uh, patients who have had uh, uh, multiple comorbidities and none of those comorbidities were made worse with the hypercapnia. I think that, that, um, that as a life form on this planet, uh, hypercapnia doesn't seem to be something that, uh, that harms us. It's hypoxia and hypocapnia that's probably more harmful to our physiology. Okay. And then someone wanted to know about uh, whether you noticed any differences for, uh, between the anterior and posterior circulations. Um, they noted that they they see difference kind of clinically in patients in response to hypertension between the two um, circulations. So have you, have, you, have you looked into that at all? Or oh, yeah. <laughs> we noticed them. Uh, and uh, we're, we think about it a lot and we see them. We don't have anything that we've done systematically that I can report at this point. Because, But do we notice them? Oh, yeah. And we notice them specifically in the specific patients. And, um, and it, we, don't have, we don't have a good enough picture for me to describe. But yes, there are differences in anterior and posterior. And I think that that's something that's missed in the literature. I did a literature review of this about uh, six or eight weeks ago or something like that. I didn't come up with a lot of papers. I think I only came up with about a half dozen of papers who, who just mention it. 
in passing rather than being the focus of the study. Um, whoever asked that question, I think, has also noticed that. And uh, the answer is yes, there's some sort of difference that we haven't figured out yet. Okay. Um, there's another kind of a general question. Um, this person says, you showed nicely that when assessing cerebrovascular reactivity, it's crucial to take into account the speed of the vascular response. Um, does this mean that several CVR MRI studies published uh, need to re be reevaluated um, where this was not performed? Um. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to say probably yes. Um, it, it turns out from, uh, from our experience that this speed of response rather than the CVR, we started off as CVR people, as all the people out there whose faces I see there know very well, you know, we were sure that this was going to be the, uh, uh, the main metric that we would use to assess people. But uh, over time, uh, at least to me personally, it is very clear that the speed of response is by far the more sensitive uh, metric and uh, I think if if I think focusing in on that will will bear uh, much more data and scientific insight than than sticking with um, you know taking an amplitude dividing it by a PCO two change of which is hard to otherwise um, it's hard to draw information from that whereas speed of response I think focuses in on the very fundamental part of what we are looking, which is the responsiveness of blood vessels. I think that's where all the money is. So if I'm a bank robber, that's where I, that's where I think I would go. All right, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll, we'll go back to the first talk. A couple of questions just popped up to Dr. Whittingstall. Um, so one of them says, considering the fact that CBF may not always be an accurate marker of neural activation, um, how do you think the functional connectivity obtained by functional near infrared spectroscopy data can be interpreted? Mm -hmm. uh, we're interested um, in the perivascular innervation. So we're actually trying using uh, diffusion imaging to reconstruct these large cranial nerves. And we're trying to actually track uh, the nerve as it comes into contact with the large artery. Now, we, we, we can't do that in, in the smaller vessels in, in the gray matter, but we're getting some promising results, um, at least in the circle of Willis. And what we're finding is that, and this, I mean, there's some very nice, very old uh, literature on this topic from the 40s and 50s, where they show that the type of perivascular innervation is different depending on what arterial territory you're in. So the posterior circulation has a different type of innervation than say at the MCA or ACA. And so if there's a sympathetic volley or say a parasympathetic volley, one could imagine that that alone could cause um, you know, systemic constriction among both the right and left PCA. And so that would promote functional connectivity in the occipital lobe, but not in the other areas of the brain. And so I often wonder whether or not uh, these massive volleys coming from very, very low levels in the central nervous system might be playing a role in what we often interpret as neuronal connectivity. Uh, so I guess I'm going older and older school, the older and older I get, uh, but... Uh, that's how I may, or at least that's how I view functional connectivity now. Okay, thank you so much. And um, the other question was, um, in one of the studies you presented uh, that females have significantly decreased vascular density compared to males. Um, I'm wondering if you accounted for vessel size um, for both females and males. So. If females had a smaller vessel size, for example, uh, potentially there it's less the, the vessels are less detectable, um, and it might appear as a lower vascular density. Um, so. so, so yes, uh, most definitely, excellent point. We always check for vessel size when we're computing density, and most definitely it explains a bit of it, but it doesn't explain all of it. And one thing we often forget it in that in women, uh, the blood is also thinner. And so it's easier to kind of schlep it around. So 
while a smaller vessel would reduce the signal we get, the higher velocity, at least on TOF imaging, will actually cause more vessels to appear in women than in men, because the arterial transit times are different. So it, it, I mean, it might balance out, it might not, but uh, until we get very nice measures of blood velocity and blood rheology, um, I think we can't rule out that these differences in vascular density uh, could be uh, one of those two things. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Whittingstall. Um, so the uh, so just uh, to to the talk by Dr. Uh, Chan. Um, I had a question actually, actually, because you mentioned. I mean, I was surprised to hear just kind of how many um, kind of physiologically relevant uh, respiratory gas metrics that you that you um, listed um, and how these kind of can have completely or, or very different kind of interactions with the bolt signal. So wh what do you think, um, what do you think this has um, as a consequence for like the experimental paradigms that, that we use? So do you, for example, always, would you recommend kind of using breath hold and exogenous CO2 um, like in the study that you presented or, or um, what kind of consequences does that have for, for kind of a, an experimental paradigm? So I think you're muted, uh, Dr. Chan. Okay. Um, I think for the resting state first, um, for the resting state, I think it provides an alternative because um, this is kind of the, uh, say, the O2 CO2 is considered as the physiological fluctuations. So it depends on whether we consider it as the physiological confines. So just same as the other physiological confines before in the resting state analysis, then we, we can include it to say, if we want to focus on the neuronal uh, contribution, we possibly will take away this kind of the physiological confines and then we consider it as noise. But uh, uh, in contrast, we can consider it as the kind of the physiological, say, useful signals to look at how the cerebrovascular hemodynamics changes in the resting state. So it actually, say, looking at the relationship between the respiratory gas exchange for the lung function, the respiratory function, and also the brain response. So in terms of the uh, breathful challenge, so breathful challenge, um, uh, basically, we started out these studies, we have the problem of doing the exogenous uh, CO2 challenge for some of the patients, especially in the acute cases in the hospital. So um, that's why we switched to the breathal challenge. So I think um, going back to your questions, say what is the consequences of the um, say impact is that um, say it can be treated as the kind of alternative. Um, to look at the cerebrovascular reactivity. But obviously, um, we also look at the results, um, the CVR results from the exogenous CO2 and also with the breath hole, with the charge. And uh, we saw that there, they got a lot of similarity. But obviously, with the exogenous CO2 charge, it got more signals. Yeah. So if, if, it depends on the settings, say what um, uh, subject population that we target. If the subject population that we cannot apply for exogenous um, CO2 challenge for whatever the reasons, then um, one can consider the breath hole. Okay, thanks so much. Um, we have a question for uh, Dr. Matteo. Um, so it's, it's similar to, to, or kind of related to the point that Dr. Wittingstall uh, made just a moment ago. Um, do you think that the coherence um, that you that you measured, that, that you um, noticed in acalosal mice could be explained by vascular innervation? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's a complete possibility. Um, there's one thing, uh, I'd like to go back on another question where someone asked if it was significant. Uh, I look back at the graph, I mean, like the coherence in both sides in the acalosal mouse is sometimes still significant, but you see, a, you, you do see a large drop, so. Um, a large drop in significance compared to the- Yeah. The yeah. yeah, the other thing is that these mice are still like, um, 
there's a copy when it comes to neural modulation, they are common inputs that are going to similar areas. So that could also really explain that. Because that can, even when you look at color, um, having the colosum uh, cut in the rat, I think that was a paper from Sheila Kailots, you do still keep some of the gamma. You do have a decrease in the coherence of the gamma on both sides, but like uh, some of it is gone. So it's not a, it's not complete. Okay. Um, just as a general comment, sorry, I might have forgotten to mention this, but uh, just to any of the speakers or panelists or attendees, if you'd like to jump in and ask a question, comment on something, please, please just, just do, uh, do that. Ahmed, can I ask something piggybacking a little bit on, on what you, what you said? I think it's a sort of a combination of some comments on, um, on, on Phoebe's talk and something what Zan mentioned about the, about the OE2. So as a, as a sort of, I think like as a sort of, so, you know, I'm by no means a CBR expert, but what would be the general advice in terms of, you know, should we take into consideration O2 when we do CVR? Like it just, just as a sort of a general sort of advice for people that are interested in looking at CVR, because I think there are some messages out there that, you know, the O2 is not as, you know, responsive as CO2. And so there is sort of a mixed bag of comments. So what, what would the advice be in terms of um, you know, I want to do a CVR experiment. I have biopack. I want to collect some data. Should I collect O2, CO2, and what should I do with this sort of CVR analysis uh, when I have those um, those data? Yeah. So uh, if you are looking at the CVR, say um, at rest, and also um, uh, under breath of change, as what we did in our study. So I would suggest you collect both CO2 and O2. So I, I understand that, um, say, there, are, there is the huge, um, say, in the community, um, people believe that um, there is not much contribution of the O2. And then it is basically based on the other two studies before. So, um, but, um, so we also look at all those literature before and then try to analyze the data. Uh, available in the in the articles, and then say some of the uh, long uh, long beliefs that um, the um, say the CO two um, no the O two has to for say um, have to reduce the, until say reaching reaching to the level of fifty millimeter mercury, then you will have the change in the CDF. Okay, so before that you should have the small change in the CDF. So, um, but uh, but this is what uh, they are talking about the mean value. So we have covered in our slide saying that there is the actually a homeostatic process. Homeostatic process means that it actually the CBF and also the respiratory gas matrix it fluctuates uh, over time. So we have the homeostatic process to put it back to the mean level. So what we are looking at in the resting state, also the spontaneous fluctuation is fluctuation instead of the mean value. Okay, so so there is no conflict at all with that statement because um, if you look at um say if we go back to our slides and then um, you can see that for the say um, ten millimeter mercury of the delta change in the PO two, we have the CBRV of ten centimeter per second change in the resting state. And then uh, for the bow signals, obviously bow signals is, a little, um, is smaller. Yeah, we all know that. But um, uh, if we go to the breath hole change, we got a lot more fluctuation, which can go up to say 40 millimeter mercury of the delta PO2 changes. So we can have the CBF of the, um, say around 40 centimeter per second. It can go back to our papers and also our slides. But um, the thing is that what we are measuring, what we are looking at is the fluctuation. And we also, so one more thing is that uh, we look at this kind of the fluctuation. It has also been reported previously. People studying the time series, especially in those papers in um, say in 40s, 50s, or even 90s. And the breath will change, there is the change of the delta PO2. And then, and so 
the significance of our studies is only that we, we correlate this kind of the change in the O2, delta O2 with the CBF. And we really see that there is the big correlation. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, ben, did you, do you have a question? I think you, you mentioned you had a question. Yeah, sure. Actually, it's uh, Fernando Zelaya's question from earlier to Joe, Joe Fisher. So uh, he says that Hanjan Lu has shown that the actual amplitude of the bold response depends on the baseline level of venous oxygenation it very substantially. Maybe this could be a big factor that differentiates the good voxels from the bad voxels. And I'm just going to, I'm going to append. Uh, I'm just curious what the role of hematocrit might be. And uh, since Manus is on, I don't know, he's interested in sickle cell. Um, what that might mean for somebody with anemia. And just to uh, repeat the first part uh, sure. again. Sure. Hanzan Lu has shown that the actual amplitude of the bold response depends on the baseline oxygenation level, the base, baseline venous oxygenation, so the oxygen extraction factor, basically. It varies substantially. Uh, and I know it varies with hematocrit. He's shown that. Maybe this could be a big factor that, ex that differentiates good voxels from bad voxels, which I guess is another way of saying if you don't have um, uh, a, if you don't have a good oxidation difference, you're going to you're not going to get a response anyway, right? Regardless of what the flow is doing. Right. Okay. So these things are, are a little bit intertwined. If you have a poor uh, venous PO two. Uh, the uh, tissue probably isn't getting the flow that it would desire. So uh, it's not that the, that the uh, venous PO2 is lower or different. It's that it's something that affects both things. It's not an independent factor uh, is, is the first thing. And then the second part was about the uh, anemia. And this again falls into the same category. So uh, the uh, anemia reduces the amount of oxygen delivery due to uh, hematocrit, and then you have flow. When you put both of them together, you get a net oxygen delivery. So it's a combination. So again, the anemia isn't an independent factor. It, uh, it's the general oxygen delivery that, that is a factor, and that's a function of both the anemia and the uh, vascular reactivity. I don't think you can you can separate those out. We we are now actually uh, examining patients with various types of anemia, including sickle cell, and uh, they definitely have a, a different type of response. But it's all explainable when you look at uh, the oxygen delivery, the net oxygen delivery, and uh, the only uh, adaption that the anemic patients have for their anemia or the main adaption, they can, they can right shift the oxygen globe association curve, but the, the other adaption is just to increase their cerebral blood flow. And in physiology, there's a principle that you never get full compensation. So as the anemia goes down, the blood flow goes up, but it's probably never fully compensated. So once they're very anemic, you're, you've got very little vascular flow reserve left. If you do a CVR there, you're not going to get a large response, not because they're anemic, because they've used up the CVR to try to maintain their oxygen delivery to the brain. And they don't succeed because that's a principle of biology that no compensatory factor uh, gives you complete compensation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Molly's got a hand up. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Molly. Hi, I have a, a question, maybe more generally to all the speakers to try to put some things together. So we observe, and I think this is in agreement with the literature, that women have lower CVR. And we've heard also that there's a difference in density, a difference in blood properties, and probably lots of other differences besides that. Now, I don't personally view being a woman as a pathology, but I guess my question is, do we understand this difference, this sex difference in some of the parameters we're looking at? And can we explain it in a way that the explanation gels with what we would see in pathology? Or is it looking like 
the differences we see are a completely separate category with different explanations? Big question, general question, but just curious. Uh, well, I mean, um, cut me off if I go uh, too long, but uh, I think this is a very, very uh, important aspect when trying to interpret sex differences. Um, you know, we, we found that depending on uh, the menstrual cycle of a woman, uh, blood flow to the brain is very, very different. And uh, whether or not that's an actual blood flow difference or just because progesterone uh, can change uh, the makeup of blood and affect arterial transit times, uh, whether or not during the, during the luteal phase with heightened sympathetic activity, uh, whether this constricts vessels. And so I think that uh, as a community, we need to start paying attention to, to, to these things, because I think Molly's point that I, I, I'm not sure if being a woman means being a pathology, uh, but I do think that the vascular properties were designed to be completely different. Sometimes we wonder if female blood vessels are inherently just a bit smaller such that during pregnancy, they have room to grow to accommodate this massive increase in blood volume without causing any squeezing uh, within the, the parenchyma. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, this is something that interests me and uh, I think I'm in the right place to finally start talking about this stuff. So excellent point. Can I make a point about that as well? Uh, there's, there's something quite different about uh, the female cerebrovascular reactivity. And we didn't notice it because when we did 50 people and we looked at the difference between males and females, we saw very subtle, I mean, you really had to squint if you wanted to show that there was a difference, you know, as opposed to Jean, I think Jean found that there was a, a bigger difference. We didn't find one at all, but if you look at, uh, at, at certain women, for example, those that had pregnancies where there was some toxemia of pregnancy, uh, when they develop, when, when they're just pregnant, their CVR is normal. When they develop toxemia, their CVR goes away. And the interesting thing is that after they deliver, they still have no CDR. And 40 years later, they still have no CDR. There's something there that I don't think we have a, a, a handle on. But um, if you look at uh, those vessels pathologically, they are different in the placenta and uh, probably in the brains. I believe in the brains. And uh, so I think that it's very important to look more carefully. We just did a kind of bland survey, you know, we examined 50 people on that, that was that. I think we should have looked, and I think this requires some effort. Uh, we need to look more carefully. We need to take a better uh, obstetrical history, a better hormonal history. Uh, we need to look at what drugs they're on and we need to follow them. I think that there's, uh, we have a big, black unseen area as far as the uh, the cerebrovascular function in females. I think we just yeah, yeah. need to look and we'll see it. I think, uh, Joe, if I could just add one 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 thing is we, we recently did the same thing uh, and then we separated our women um, uh, based on whether or not they had experienced even moderate uh, gestational hypertension. And uh, and then right off the bat, you, 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 you could, you could separate these 50 year old women uh, based on uh, on a acute phase of hypertension that was uh, that was no, no more than, than six months, but the differences are still visible many years later. Have you have you tried to compare that to, to, to just people with chronic hypertension or with poorly poorly um, treated chronic hypertension with like kind of acute exacerbations and or just to, to see, or to males with those conditions, basically? Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're currently looking at uh, uh, preeclamptic women who are under uh, antihypertensive medication, uh, but there are very few preeclamptic women, at least at our research center, so right. I can't really speak on that yet. Okay. I think that uh, we, we've gotten lots of patients that have hypertension and, uh, that are on all sorts of medication. 
And um, it's probably because we haven't looked carefully enough because the effect size is probably small in those people and the variability in the CVR is large. So, you know, we haven't noticed them, but for uh, the women who are hypertensive during pregnancy, I think that's a totally different uh, process than it is uh, in just hypertensive people, whether they are males or females. I think that that process really required, there's something definitely uh, some large area that we can't see at the moment that's just hiding in plain sight that I think we just have to look. Yeah, and uh, Blaze brings up a great point about this or a great question. Is there any way to tell if this is cause or effect? Do women with altered supervascular activity end up having hypertension during pregnancy? So could it be that the answer is no. Okay. Uh, before they develop their their uh, toxemia of pregnancy, their CVRs on those that had CVRs for some reason, I have to look back and see why they, they would have had CVRs uh, being pregnant but not being hypertensive are normal. It's only after their blood pressure goes up that they become abnormal. So uh, it's not necessarily the blood pressure causes the abnormality. These are correlates. They're not necessarily causation. Piggybacking a little bit on that is, uh, you know, we also been looking with um, Emily Jacobs from um, at UCSB. We're looking at, uh, we're comparing basically CPF in women that are under birth control pills versus not. And then we've also seen some differences there in CPF. So there is just a lot of amazing, interesting stuff that can be that it's we haven't even touched, I guess. And I think it's an excellent question, Molly, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think it's it's just it's an interesting perspective for me to start considering. I, I don't think I do it enough in my own research. Um, but the idea that this is such a huge source of potential variability with so many different mechanisms at play. And it's not, I mean, uh, keeping aside what we just talked about that has to do with pathology, but just the variation that wouldn't be considered pathological, it's just natural human variation and making sure we can wrap our heads around that. And does it point us to mechanisms we haven't fully considered or don't have good imaging metrics for or, or ways of tracking and monitoring and quantifying. And so I, I, think, I think I'd really like to see that what I would consider healthy variation in mechanism understood, because I think it will bear fruit for when we do want to look at then pathological responses. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we've got a lot of women in the world and, and making sure that we, we fully capture that side of variability, I think would be very productive. So Molly, can I ask you then, do you think, or do you, do you suspect that there is a greater diurnal variation in women than in men? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's my question because I'm so new to thinking about it, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think other people here may know more than I about this. Um, I haven't tracked any variations with any diurnal variations, actually, or, or other aspects in terms of hormonal fluctuations in women specifically. So um, I don't know if Kevin or, or someone else has done this. So, so then in, let me broaden it even further because uh, Giannis and I have been looking at, we've been looking at uh, exercise as an adjuvant for uh, therapy. So first thing we did was test retest reliability and we're not getting what we hoped we would get. And then one of the things we realized was we were, we were all caffeine drinkers. And we, so we said, well, you know, we're going to come in early in the morning. We're going to do this paradigm. We're going to have an exercise component and we'll rescan and et cetera, et cetera. We want to control for everything. Don't drink coffee in the morning. And then we find a paper that says, ah, if you're a coffee drinker, you need to have that in your routine. If you take that out, you will completely clamp up the vascular chip. Absolutely chicken. brutal, by the way. Right. Yeah, right, right. And it's miserable too. It makes your subjects miserable. So, so that's another factor, you know, that we often we're not tracking. Uh, and it's generally diurnal in that we, our caffeine level changes through the day, just through life, life um, style factors. So is there is this is this something so broad that we've got to consider things like caffeine, things like sleep, sleep deprivation, uh, hormone fluctuations? Is this really what what you're sort of getting to? And we we've got to treat all people, not just women. There's a variation, but there's much more natural variation in there than we might like to think. Oh, well, for sure. Um, I think 
what I'm starting to uh, see is that we're a little bit behind some of our colleagues who focus on your, your typical bold neural relationships um, in the fMRI literature. We don't have big data. Um, I, I think we're, we're only starting to agree exactly what we want to measure and how we want to measure it and what it all means. Um, but the types of things that you're describing, Ben, I think that that's the sort of thing you pull out by having a lot of data with that richness of information accompanying your imaging information. Um, the alternative experiment is one that I've started to work on with my collaborators in Spain is the precision functional mapping paradigm, where you have a much smaller N, a very small sample size, but you try to get a lot of this variability captured by repeated assessment of that small cohort. And I think that might be something that's more immediately accessible for our community where, um, you know, maybe we're not going to convince the UK Biobank to collect CDR and, and whatnot, but maybe we could with slightly different resources and a different scope of experiments still get some of the same insight. Um, so that's that's the direction I'm starting to, to focus a bit more on, and I think it might be a little bit more immediately accessible. But you do, and you'd also, you need to capture, if you don't ask the question, you don't capture the information at source. Exactly. So if you don't screen for caffeine consumption, right. sleep deprivation, you don't measure those variables, you'll never figure right. it out with the large area. Right. So, I mean, that's, the, that's what, what, I, what I like about the, the MyConnectome data, right? Russ scanned himself a bazillion times, and you see the clear separation with on and off caffeine. Right. But he, but exactly. he made sure he tracked all the variables, how much sleep he had, whether he drank alcohol the night before, and that. I yeah, so, it's, so doing that, but you know, with a slightly more than n of one, um, I, I think right. might be the the good next step. Right. All right. Um, so there's a comment from from. Um, Ravi Menon, who says, uh, ultimately, n equals one is needed for diagnostics, so I don't view non-big data as a limitation. Um, Second. Well. <laughs> I agree. All right. Um, are there any more questions from, from anyone, any of the attendees or panelists, speakers? All right. So um, since we're just a little bit kind of over time, then uh, maybe we should uh, wrap up this uh, this first session. Um, the second session today starts in just over two hours, so 7 p.m. Uh, coordinated universal time. Um, and uh, yes, uh, you can use the same uh, Zoom link basically to attend that second session. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you all, all then. Thank you so much again to our speakers. Um, for contributing and uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. <laughs>